opposed to any kind of uh, covid carrier okay okay my grandchildren are here uh -huh. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Very nice. Evening. As if you're going for a Bollywood shoot. <laughs> you know, at least that gives me the feeling that yeah. I am in a in a seminar or webinar or a conference. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good, good evening, Parag. Good evening. Hi, Hi. Hi, sir. Hi, Hi, CN, sir. Hello. Hi, Parag. Welcome. Hi, Lata. Hi, Charu. Hi, hi. Mangala, hi, good Dr. to see you. Hi, Charu. Hello, Sarveshwari ji. Long time. Hi. I know. Parag. Parag, don't change my name here on webinar. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, Sneha. <coughs> Man, we are live now. Thank you so much. So with the permission of the chair, I would like to start the webinar on breast disease saga. A very good evening to each and every one of you and a Merry Christmas to all. We hope that Santa Claus and the incoming new year bring in good health, happiness and prosperity to all of us. I, Dr. Charulata Bappe, National Coordinator, Foxy Breast Committee, takes immense pleasure in welcoming one and all to this wonderful webinar. This has been put forth by Uttarakhand, Dev Bhumi, all the OBG1 societies of this particular area, and of course, the Foxy Breast Committee. Dr. Aarti Luthra and Dr. Sneha Bhuyar are the pillars behind this webinar, and it is indeed a privilege to be working with these two wonderful women. This webinar would not have been possible without the support and blessing of our beloved friend, Dr. Kumari, Madam. So let us hear her message. Hello, friends. I'm Dr. Shanta Kumari, President of Foxy. Foxy is the Federation of Obstetrics yeah. and Gynecologists of India with 37,000 gynecologists members. Friends, this year we come with a theme Foxy for all, always, and Dheera, stop by experiment. Foxy believes in taking care of our adolescents because a healthy adult is only possible if the adolescent is healthy. Friends, Foxy is celebrating the adolescent healthy from 1st to 7th of September, culminating in Foxy Adolescent Health Day on the 7th of September between 4 to 8 p.m., where we are coming with a virtual program which are going to cover so many issues which are a concern to today's adolescents, parents, and teachers. So we invite you all to join us for this webinar so that all your myths and fears are busted. Friends, we know that today the pandemic has made the virtual platform online education as a means of education. And that comes with its own problems. So let's see how well we can take care of the mental health of our adolescents. Friends, we have to address so many issues. Adolescents have a lot of doubts about PCOS, menstrual problems, mental health issues, and peer pressure. We are here to help our adolescents. There are nutritional issues. We find anemia is a major problem. We find malnutrition, which covers both undernutrition and obesity are issues which the adolescent faces today. Friends, together we can try to bust these myths. This year, Dheera, which is an initiative which says no to violence against women, an initiative which was started in 2016, to say that we care for our women. Dheera means courage. Courage to say no to violence against women. Friends, this year, I'm coming forward with a new page, Dheera Online Certification Course. This is being collaborated with the UNICEF and WHO. 
we're going to do a simple online certification course which will come to all of you that will make you all aware of this menace and friends we hope that this course will make the adolescent of today a dhira to be very courageous and say no to violence against women and this will pave the way for a more gender neutral society friends join us on the 7th of uh, september for the virtual meeting where we are there to actually address all the issues thank you thank you so much it is only with dhira that our women are going to be able to face their breast problems and so we will definitely be taking madam's cause forward uh again our dear vice chair vice president foxy dr archana verma ma'am is always a great pillar of support without whom no webinar is possible madam thank you always for your kind support and today we are blessed with two fantastic and famed foxians to be our chief guests none other than the swav dr c n purandare sir who has put india on the international map and the bhishma or the pitamaha of um, foxy dr p k shah sir welcome uh, respected foxians as our chief guest for today and we also have with us as our guests of honor dr uday thanawala sir who is the chairman icog along with dr parag beniwale sir who is the vice chairperson icog and extremely good friends dear friends i invite you all to the virtual inauguration of our webinar on breast diseases saga dr arti luthra ma'am dr sneha ma'am all our esteemed faculty our respected guests and delegates we request you to join <laughs> faculties we now declare that the webinar uh, has started and um, i will go a little against protocol uh, we will be starting um, our talks with dr c n purandare blessing this webinar uh, he is the president elect figo and the dean indian college of ob of obstetricians and gynecologists he is a teacher par excellence uh, he has his degrees from india and ireland we all know him as a fantastic uh, teacher as a charismatic individual and he is indeed a role model to many of us over to you dr c n purandare sir for your words of wisdom thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to for the inauguration of this uh, workshop um small correction i am now the uh, past president of figo yes. i'm sorry the old slide which you are projecting here showing me as president elect of figo which was uh, prior to 2015 um anyway i i'm very happy that um, you are holding this seminar on uh, breast awareness and uh, it's very important uh, that uh, people should um, uh, concentrate on this because the first point of contact for a woman is the obstetrician gynecologist because if there is any problem that the first place that they go to and um, uh, we started the breast committee in foxy and i started that in figo as well for breast uh, um, awareness cancer and benign pathology of the breast and um tarin taneja was one of the members of the committee uh, at figo for the breast uh, awareness and um, even though um, in india we don't uh, deal with uh, the tumors per se 
In Germany, the gynecologists operate on all uh, breast uh, diseases. Benign or even cancer of the breast is operated by the gynecologists in Germany. So uh, you can realize that there are so many parts of the world where the gynecologists take a leading role in the uh, breast treatment. Um, today we know that the breast cancer is one of the leading killers of uh, uh, women uh, in cancer and uh, it's, it's high time that we made our fraternity aware that with every patient walking in, you must have a, 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 the breast examination done to pick up early lumps and uh, get investigated so that we, we are not delaying the treatment uh, uh, per se. So all the very best to you all for uh, this very important uh, CME that we are holding. And uh, the committee, including Sneha, who has been working very hard uh, on this and um, I wish you all the very best. Unfortunately, I have to rush, so I will not be able to continue with your uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and um, again, I wish you the very best. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, respected sir. In fact, so sorry, I got disconnected because of the network issues here. It's raining very heavily in Yavatmal. So thank you so much once again, sir, for accepting our invitation and being here for blessing us. Uh, sir, thank you. So, for so many reasons, uh, these are uh, Dr. C. N. Purandare and Dr. P. K. Shah. These are the two legions of Foxy. Uh, looking at whom we have uh, common Foxians like us decide to join this organization. And I'm very happy to share with you all that these are the two uh, legions whom, at the hands of whom I have received my first individual national award uh, at 2008, and I've received my FICOG at Varanasi in 2012. So thank you so much, sir, for blessing me and all the Foxians. Always thank you so much for your words of wisdom as well. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Over to you, Charu. Yeah. Uh, may I invite Dr. Ardi Luthra, ma'am, to kindly introduce uh, our next chief guest, Dr. P.K. Shah, sir. Madam, over to you. Good evening. Good evening, dear friends. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. C.N. Purendre, sir, and Dr. P.K. Shah, sir, for agreeing to be with us and sparing their valuable time for this webinar uh, of Uttarakhand Societies along with uh, Breast Foxy Breast Committee. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. P.K. Shah, sir, uh, a very senior Foxy legend whom I have been seeing since my PG days and he's uh, an excellent speaker and all his talks, you know, as youngsters I have enjoyed. Sir is professor and unit head at Department of OBGYN, said GS Medical College and KM Hospital, Peril, Mumbai. Dr. Shah has been passed in at Indian College of Medical Ultrasound, ICMU, from 2015 to 2016. He's been past president Foxy, past president IFUMB, uh, MOGS, and Association of Full-Time Teachers, KM Hospital. Sir has been past vice president at Senior Medical Teachers Association. He is an ardent uh, academician. He's been past vice dean at uh, Indian College of Medical Ultrasound and he's been past chairperson at Imaging Science Committee Foxy and ISOPOP West Zone and sir has been joint secretary of images. Mm -hmm. Sir has done immense work in ultrasonography uh, and uh, he's been a fellow at Wellstart International USA. He's been past editor of the journal today. Sir, I would invite you to give us your blessings and uh, to share your pearls of wisdom with us. Welcome, thank, sir. Thank you, Aarti, for your kind words. At the outset, let me thank Dr. Shanta Kumari, Dr. Madhuri Patel, Dr. Arshan Varma, and above all, Dr. Sneha Bhuyar, Chair of the Committee Foxy, for giving me this opportunity to be with you all as chief guest. Thank you, Aarti, for uh, leading Uttarakhand in this particular webinar. 
it's very easy now we feel to arrange a webinar but when it comes to really doing it i think people who organize only know how difficult it is when sneha called me up obviously i was starving to be with some webinar on breast disease and i immediately accepted i have seen these three ladies neha mangalavani and uh, charu doing this work for such a long time and i call them a trio sri devi in devia of foxy in breast disease committee excellent work absolutely excellent work whenever i have attended their seminars i'm thrilled i was thoroughly impressed and satisfied and i wish not, not only this webinar but all the future activities that breast committee wants to do in, in future it's pleasure to share this platform with my friend guide and philosopher dr sain purandare and it's so nice to have dr uday thanawala and dr parag biniwale in this webinar as guests of honor so thank you sneha and wish you all the very best for whatever you do in future and um, not only at the hands of dr cn and myself you got first ficog and other awards but there are many accolades waiting for you in future so all the very best and all the very best to this webinar see you uh, i'll remain with you for some time and maybe after about 6 o'clock i will be with you thank you yes sir thank you thank you so much thank you sir it was uh, so nice of you to mention us and um, uh, it you know it just helps us to work better and uh, take this committee forward in um, in a in a more better way thank you very much uh, dr pk shah sir and now uh, it is my proud privilege to welcome dr parag biniwale um, again Charu, dr uday first dr uday first is the chairperson okay i'm sorry parag is perfectly all right it doesn't matter dr uday welcome uh, to our webinar um, as our guest of honor a uh, dear friend and as of today chairperson of the icog we are looking forward and we are already seeing the amount of work that uday thanawala sir is doing and taking icog to even greater heights i am so looking forward to receiving my degree at your yes. hands dr uday he is a skilled surgeon and um, a member of the new european uh, uh, association surgical association he is an active member uh, ex vice president of foxy boondi matlab agar hum dakte se bol loge to kareeb 700 gram matlab 125 gram ke kareeb bhar jayegi please mute the other phones please ha na aadha dibba ho jayega aur he uh, is a nursing home in navi mumbai and uh, he has been the founder secretary and the president of the navi mumbai obgyn society Huh? he has been the chair person of the medical disorders oh, and pregnancy oh, committee uh, from 2006 to 2009 he has been invited as faculty to numerous oh, national and international conferences and has contributed many chapters and books uh, published oh, on oh, the subject over to you dr uday uh, for your words yeah, you were wait to hear from me dr uday it was nice to see you in the christmas cap and uh... in the holiday spirit but you are doing so much work in the holiday spirit also uh, so thank you for that and you know what when when you and stay are so so all in so the so 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 related so with the mohammad boki bundi aayegi kele aa jayenge paas sir sorry sorry for this background noise vasu uh, vasu please mute everyone except dr uday thana vasu so basically uh, you know the work which you are doing is phenomenal this is not the first time i've come on your platform every time i come i get something new some new inputs i still remember that clip which we had shown of cancer survivors etc it's amazing i mean the amount of effort you people put in into the committee work and foxy work is really great i wish you all the best 
And I think we should do something like that, make a short module on the breast things and you know, do it through ICOG or something like that we should think of do uh, uh, doing uh, in future. So think about all that, we will do that. And of course, it's great to see Aarti here uh, and uh, Mitra here who are always uh, very, very good and keen workers. So uh, all the best to you for the, uh, this webinar. And I'm very excited about the topics because there's so much of myth that if you have a breast, breast abscess uh, while breastfeeding, you know, don't even breastfeed and all. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's high time that we gynecs know what exactly has to be done when, when the woman develops a complication like a breast abscess and all. I mean, the topics you've chosen is very, very practical, very, very down to earth. I'm very, very impressed by the whole program and uh, all the best to you all and wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, some network issue with Charu. Thank Dr. Aarti, you can you. Always on. to have you on our program. Our dear own Punekar, um, somebody who has had with my hand and talk to you, which you want. Another thing, Dr. Parag Bini. Uh, one another charismatic yes. uh, yes. whom we uh, hope to see much more and more, but even in Foxy per se. Uh, he is a PG teacher and unit head at Kamla Nehru Hospital. Uh, yes, he's currently the vice chairperson ICOG. He's the president of Menopause Society of Pune. The president elect will be. I think Charu is facing wise. some. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Charu, for those so, kind words. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. I bring greetings from relatively warm city of Pune. I know our friends in the north are freezing, but here we are sitting comfortably in our own cabins. At the outset, thank you, Sneha. Uh, and the entire team for uh, having me here as a guest of honor. It's always uh, a pleasure to be part of the breast committee activities. And uh, commenting on what uh, Dr. P.K. Shah has said, uh, sir, we would certainly look forward to seeing you physically in Pune in the month of August. Now, I'm uh, as a president of Pune OBGY Society from April, I'm uh, extending a warm invitation to you because there are these three women are the ones who are going to have some excellent Best. program in Pune in the month of August. So uh, please uh, keep your dates free so that we can have you with us in Pune. And today's webinar is definitely interesting because as gynecologists, we are the first point of contact for any woman who comes to us with uh, issues related to the breast. So Charu talking about nipple discharge, Aarti talking about evaluation of breast clump and uh, our own Mangala, who's the, uh, I, I would say the encyclopedia of breastfeeding uh, relates. So whenever we have any problems related to breastfeeding, just a call to Mangala and our problems are, are solved. And of course, uh, Sneha is going to moderate uh, a panel discussion about various uh, conditions. So uh, it's indeed interesting program and I'm happy to say that ICOG has granted one credit point uh, for this program. So uh, my best wishes for the program and I'm looking forward to some interesting discussion also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farag. It is so great to have three Punekars and a fourth one also in the form of Sneha, who is basically a Punekar to be on this webinar. And we are indeed looking forward to coming August. And uh, yes, we, we uh, should have a great program uh, in uh, August 2022. Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Sneha Bhuyar to kindly give an overview of uh, the work of the Breast Committee and the upcoming program. Over to you, Dr. Sneha. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Charu. Um, once again, I would <clears throat> just like to thank uh, respected FOXI President Dr. Shantakumari, Secretary General Dr. Madhuri Patel, and our Vice President in charge Dr. Uh, Archana Varma. Uh, Vasu, you can uh, uh, just make it a gallery show. You can just uh, remove the CD. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. I'm sorry, uh, because it's raining very heavily, I uh, lost my connection. 
And uh, I w- once again, I would like to welcome and thank all of you, respected to uh, CN Purandare sir, Dr. PK Shaha sir, Dr. Uday Chanawala sir, and Dr. Parag Biniwale, our dear friend. I would like to welcome all the faculties, including the um, OXI chairpersons, uh, Dr. Anju Soni, Chairperson HIV AIDS Committee, Dr. Mitra Saxena, um, Chairperson Practical Obstetrics Committee, uh, Dr. Arpi Lutra, who is the President of Uttarakhand Dehradun Society, all our respected uh, dignitaries, all the faculties, chairperson, and all the viewers. I would like to extend a warm welcome and thank you all for joining this. Um, as a press committee, uh, we are working on three aspects mainly breastfeeding, uh, benign breast diseases, and uh, aware screening and early detection of breast cancer. So we are organizing um, academic session, releasing newsletters, updates, and readiness for our POPSIANS. We are sensitizing the POPSIANS that yes, uh, <clears throat> by virtue of our practice, uh, breast is I think I think her internet connection is very unstable. Yeah. That leads to increased mortality. So we are the one who are privileged. We can examine all the women for whatever problems they come to us, and we can you know, be the saviors of these women. We are struggling so hard to save them from these obstetric catastrophes and we are losing them at breast cancer. So that is not done. And we are here. Let us all join hands to save our time. Once again, uh, I wish all the best for this program. I, I thank you everyone and over to you Charu for the academic session. Thank you so much. Indeed, a pleasure to be working uh, under you along with you uh, for uh, the breast committee. Dr. Sneha, and uh, may I request Dr. Arthi Lutra, uh, Madam, to uh, kindly express her feelings and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charu. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Sneha for having this idea of organizing this webinar on breast disease saga, management of common breast problems. As we know, gynecologist is the first clinician who would be meeting the woman who will walk to us with complaints of breast lump, nipple discharge, or pain in the breast. So we are the lucky ones, and we should not miss this opportunity to properly diagnose the case. And uh, we, we are the ones who can do early detection. And in case if it is a malignant problem, you know, we can give them the right guidelines so that they get early treatment and the survival rate of the disease is more. Although we know that maybe more than 90% of the problems would be benign problems, but it is the, the lady is at the discretion of the OBGYN because most of the times all these women who have delivered with us and their mother-in-laws, they would up, be approaching OBGYN first. So this is a very nice initiative that we are going to discuss about the common breast problems so that we don't end up referring these patients and waste their time also because a lot of times, you know, even we get to see a lady has to have courage of going to the doctor with some breast problem because of the inhibitions also and sometimes they report to us very late another thing which is very important is we should not miss the opportunity of teaching breast self-examination to all the women all the girls who approach to us for cervical cancer vaccination for pap smear for annual health checkup so we must tell them like what i do i tell them please educate all your friends all your groups that they have to do monthly breast self-examination ourselves. So we can play a great role in reducing the incidence of this deadly disease, which is the most common cause of cancers amongst women and a common cause of morbidity and mortality too. Thank you. And uh, I would like to start the academic session now. 
uh, with that, we declare that uh, the inauguration is over and our academic uh, session is just about to start. I would uh, want to share my screen once again. <clears throat> I take this opportunity to uh, welcome our first chairperson, Dr. Jaya Chaturvedi. She is uh, a professor and head of Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Ames Rishikesh since April 2013. She has been the ex-professor and HOD at HIMS Dehradun before that. She's been the recipient of various awards, including Jagdeshwari Mishra National Award of Foxy, Uttaranchal State Felicitation 2011, Nari Ratna Award 2017, and ET Health World Award 2018. She's been working with various government and NGO projects in maternal and child health care, violence against women, sexual and reproductive health funded by SIDA, GOI, WHO, and PFI. She's published and presented a large number of papers in various journals and conferences, She's the patron IFS Uttarakhand chapter, vice president Uttarakhand chapter of OBG1 Society, scientific advisor, Foxy Dehradun branch, a postgraduate guide and examiner, a PhD guide, which is not very frequently found, a supervisor for MCH gynec oncology, PDCC fetal medicine, and the scientific advisory group member, ICMR. What an illustrious person we have today as our uh, chairperson. Over to you, Jaya ma'am. Now, I am really happy to introduce for this first academic session, my charming lady Charulata. Uh, first uh, lecture is of Charulata Bapai, who is consultant gynecologist, endoscopic surgeon and obstetrician at Pune. So again, we are having one more Pune person here. She is director, GEMS Hospital and Endoscopy Center and Ashwin Hospital, Pune. And uh, more important thing related with this webinar that she is national coordinator of Foxy Breast Committee, honorary consultant at Dinanath Mangeshkar Oyster and Pearl Hospitals and Cloud9 Hospitals. She is MD from University of Pune in OBGY. Uh, she is trained at Beams under Dr. Rakesh Sinha, attended endoscopy training course at Kiel, Germany, observer training in endoscopy at Denmark, USA. Uh, she won Best Video Award at National IAGE Conference, presented many videos and presentations at international and national conferences and workshops. She is Associate Professor at Des College of Physiotherapy, Trustee Bal Kalyan Sanstha, and she is recipient of Dr. Ismita Jog Award for Exemplary Work in Adolescent Health 2019. So now I invite uh, Dr. Charulata to deliver her lecture on very, very important topic that is nipple discharge. Charu, please unmute yourself, please. Oh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, madam. Uh, I would uh, uh, give me a minute while I start sharing my screen. I just need to get out of this presentation. Oops. Is my screen visible? Uh, Charu, but it's no, uh, Brian. No, Charu. No. All right. Reshare once again. Yes, it is visible now. You can okay. start. So thank you so much for the opportunity to um, allow me to speak on abnormal nipple discharge today. Well, the breast is an organ of growing concern. The form, function, and pathology of the female breast are major concerns of medicine and society. As mammals, the breast nourishes the young. 
the breast contours occupy our attention. As obstetricians, we seek to enhance its function sometimes when um, a lactating woman has uh, claims that she is getting less amount of milk and sometimes we want to diminish its, its function when in an unfortunate case uh, a lady delivers a stillborn or has an intrauterine fetal death. As gynecologists the appearance of inappropriate discharge worries us as it could signify serious disease. We would just like to take a brief uh, look at the anatomy of the breast the breast is divided into 15 to 20 lobes by fibrous tissue septum. Each lobe consists of fibro fatty tissue. The glandular tissue consists mainly of the ductal system in a non-lactating breast. One lactiferous duct drains a lobe, as we can see over here. It is lined by cubical epithelium, which becomes stratified squamous near the opening. Now, each duct divides and subdivides and ultimately ends in the alveoli or the milk gland, which is lined by a single layer of milk secreting epithelial cells. Each alveolus is encased by a crisscross mantle of contractile myoepithelial cells, and there is a rich capillary network which surrounds the milk gland. So these are the, uh, you know, the crisscross blood vessels along with the myoepithelial cells, which help in the milk letdown. Well, when you have a nipple discharge, when the secretions from a non-lactating breast are abundant or persistent enough to discharge either spontaneously or with manipulation from the duct orifice, it is termed as a nipple discharge. It is the cause of great anxiety to the patient as well as her physician. This discharge may be physiological most of the times, but sometimes pathological. It may be unilateral or bilateral. How does one elicit the discharge? Well, the pressure must be applied to all sections of the breast beginning at the base and working upwards towards the nipple. It is the third leading breast complaint with a prevalence of 5 to 10%. And well, dear friends, out of these, 7 to 13% are malignant. And it is this malignant component that we do not wish to miss because as has been rightly mentioned by all our esteemed faculty and guests, we as gynecologists are, are usually the first point of contact uh, to all these women who first present with nipple discharge to us. So let us take a brief overview as to which are the okay discharges and which are the not so okay discharges. A little more about the fact file. The discharge is a true direct drainage from the mammary duct or the ducts, which appears on the surface of the nipple. Nipple discharge and breast cancer usually implies tumor infiltration into the ductal system. Well, until the 1950s, all nipple discharges were unfortunately subjected to mastectomies because they were unaware of what exactly is to be done with them. But today, thanks to recent advances in the diagnostic modalities, we can have a more rational outlook towards the treatment of these nipple discharges. Well, we have a beautifully colored wheel which tells us about the various kinds of nipple discharges that we can have. It can be a milky discharge, which is so common and we see it so frequently, a clear discharge, a bloody discharge, a brown discharge, a greenish discharge, a yellow discharge, or sometimes a cheesy discharge. So let us just touch upon each of these kinds of discharges and see what exactly do they signify. When we have a milky dis discharge, we have to think about whether she's a lactating woman, because we know that even post lactation for two years postpartum, you, a woman can have some kind of a milky discharge. In the second and third trimester of pregnancy, also we can have a milky discharge. Some kind of drugs like the oral contraceptives can present as milky discharges. Inappropriate galactoria because stress, prolonged sucking is an okay. old, uh, entity. Drugs, friend, is very important. The drugs like phenothiazine derivatives, anti-emetics, tanazols, and anti-hypertensive. Either of these, I would like uh. to stress upon the anti-emetics, especially, you know, when you have the domperone component in any kind of uh, medicine dealing with uh, something to decrease the acidity of women, it is almost 100% bound to cause excessive bilateral Hello. milky discharge. And we, are, we really need to ask the history of medication very appropriately. Medical and surgical disorders like hypothyroidism, pituitary adenomas, hypothalamic lesions, and diseases of the chest, which include herpes zoster, thoracotomy scars, can cause a milky discharge. Bronchogenic carcinomas are also known to cause one. What about a bloody or a serosanguinous discharge? Well, 
it the most important thing that we need to remember is that intraductal carcinoma but sometimes it can also be just a papilloma it can be duct ectasia or it can be fibrocystic disease sometimes a clear watery discharge could also be harboring a ductal cancer a greenish or a yellow discharge could look uh, you know could be uh, telling us about ductal ectasia a purulent discharge we always think of infections retroareolar abscess and in a country like ours we cannot forget about tuberculosis a serous or a sticky discharge could be talking about a fibrocystic disease we need to differentiate whether the discharge is coming from the duct or whether it is coming from the surface because then we are dealing with a different entity completely paget's disease eczema or shankers you know will cause discharges from the surface while all the earlier mentions will be discharges from the nipple and through the ducts let us go on to the clinical evaluation of a case of abnormal nipple discharge a detailed history is mandatory whether she is having amenorrhea what is her pregnancy stage status you know if you, if you are going to see bilateral discharges uh, then it is something like you know galactoria which is obviously a benign outcome if she has delivered a year or two back with milky secretions it is physiological is it a unilateral discharge or is it a bilateral discharge how long is the discharge what is the color of the discharge is she taking any medications is there any history of trauma any hormonal medications that is she is having any history of breast or ovarian cancer and now we are going to differentiate the findings into what we call as the red flag findings and the no red flag findings if the discharge is unilateral if it is uniductal if it is bloody or serous if it occurs spontaneously that means without any kind of pressure if it is persistent if there are skin or nipple changes along with it and if a lump is present then our antennae are going to be up our tentacles are going to be up that we are dealing probably with some kind of a not so good um, uh, outcome or you know or of a of a malignant kind of a picture and what would be a no red flag kind of a situation if the discharge is bilateral milky non bloody multi ductal uh, we would like to do a pregnancy test make sure that she's not pregnant uh, there's something called as a guac test to rule out blood in the discharge we do her prolactin level we do her thyroid level we might have to do an mri for a pituitary adenoma and in these cases the treatment is cause specific now we come to the management of a red flag case of nipple discharge that means we have a lump that is present okay you're going to keep hearing the word the triple assessment algorithm probably in each and every talk because a breast examination is and uh, investigation and diagnosis is based upon the triple assessment algorithm which includes a clinical assessment radiology and a histology the radiology uh, you know the um, techniques available today are ultrasound mammography and an mri histology we don't rely too much of an fnc a core renal biopsy is what we will be looking at what about sending the nipple discharge for cytology well it's a reasonably specific method in the diagnosis of malignant and suspicious cases but maybe somewhat less specific for other diagnoses if the findings are suggestive of malignancy that means you have a hard irregular lump we will be discussing all this in the coming talks then we would want to refer her probably to an onco surgeon for further management and the onco surgeon will decide whether she can undergo an oncoplasty with the you know breast conservative surgery or she requires an mrm depending on so many of the other investigations now suppose there is no lump present okay but it's a unilateral bloody discharge then we might have to think of an intraductal papilloma ductal ectasia i'm sorry but friends obviously you know you have bloody discharge maybe or you have a discharge which you are unable to find out our mind keeps going back to the thought that what if it is a malignancy what if it is a malignancy and then what are we going to do next well radiology is usually going to come to our assistance ultrasound ductography and mri or what we rely upon and today we have ductoscopy also available with us so what do with the various studies say about breast imaging in patients with nipple discharge well the mammography which we do so routinely for diagnosis of breast malignancies and for any other kind of you know breast lumps especially post 40 which we commonly use as a screening tool uh, for breast cancers it seems to have a very low sensitivity in cases of nipple discharge as low as 20 to 25% because these lesions tend to be small retroareolar intraductal and non calcified 
it can show calcification mammography usually tends to show calcifications which are mainly associated only with papillomas and ductectasias so only if these the calcifications um, you know the mammography may be able to pick it up but looks like that the ultrasound and the doppler ultrasound are of greater benefit when dealing with nipple discharge so ultrasound using high frequency transducers should always be performed in cases of nipple discharge detection of ductal carcinoma in c2 or invasive carcinoma by ultrasound has a much greater sensitivity and specificity as compared to the mammography a doppler ultrasound can differentiate an intraductal nodule from the sludge by showing vascularization so uh, what about the mri well the european society of breast cancer does not validate it in cases of abnormal nipple discharge well but it can be performed in patients with suspicious discharge and a normal ultrasound and a normal mammogram uh, the non mass enhancements are appear better with mri now we come to galactography it was once upon a time the gold standard for assessment of nipple discharge for a long time but now it is being slowly being replaced by mri because mri is now more commonly available and mri shows a higher sensitivity than galactography for ductal diseases as much as 98% but high cost and poor availability of mri can be a deterrent and hence today we even we still need to know about galactography because it stands the test of time so what exactly is galactography well it is a kind of a modified mammography it tells us how many ducts are involved calculating the duct is technically a challenging process a radio opaque dye is injected into one or more ducts and mammography is performed without sedation or anesthesia so it's like an outpatient procedure it has a sensitivity of 76% and a specificity of 11% filling defects uh, intraductal papillomas you know they can be seen irregular masses or multiple interluminal fill filling defects so it can be seen ductal ectasia would show, show dilated cystic structures again there are numerous papers which tell us about the findings at galactography in patients with nipple discharge most of the times filling defects can be seen dilatation of the ducts can be seen uh, a ductal cut off uh, can be seen and of course some end up showing a normal report uh, most of the times the diagnosis appears to be papillomas duct ectasias but friends it definitely can diagnose a ductal carcinoma in c2 and that is why it is an important test in summary the nipple ductogram is a useful tool diagnostic tool to identify and localize the cause of nipple discharge the localization ensures a high probability of removing the etiology of, of the discharge localization also offers the possibility for a focused ductal excision that preserves greater sensation and function avoids nipple inversion and decreases the likelihood of a seroma formation with the advent of breast ductoscopy which is a microendoscopic procedure today it is possible to visualize the abnormalities in the ductal system it is done commonly in cities like pune and mumbai the tissue can be retrieved for histopathology which is a very very big advantage of a ductoscopy and consequently a patient with nipple discharge is prevented from having to undergo an invasive and a fairly blindly executed surgery it can be performed as an office procedure or under anesthesia too uh with that we move on to the less frequently occurring conditions like the duct ectasia what exactly is duct ectasia it is a condition wherein the milk duct beneath the nipple widens the duct wall thickens and the duct for the duct fills with fluid the discharge originates from multiple ducts and is usually bilateral it is a disorder of the perimenopausal uh, and you know perimenopausal and postmenopausal age and you can imagine the fear of that woman if she can feel a small lump or a subarular mass with a, a strange kind of greenish or a black or a cheesy kind of discharge sometimes it can cause nipple dis and retraction which is again is a cause in, is a is a sign of malignancy sometimes it can cause inversion pain and so it can be a worrisome situation it is diagnosed with the help of ductography and ultrasound malignancy definitely needs to be excluded uh, this particular duct ectasia can get infected excision of the mass is definitely warranted and it can be left alone in you know younger patients maybe or if the patient is unwilling and you are very sure it is duct ectasia because it is usually a self limiting condition intraductal papillomas now these are benign tumors found in the breast duct with a high risk of being associated with atypium ductal carcinoma in c2 and frank carcinoma they may be central or peripheral and they may be single or multiple they present with bloody or clear nipple discharges and sometimes these papillomas can be palpable again they can be diagnosed on ultrasound galactography or on mris core needle biopsies are advised 
and the treatment involves surgical excision in the form of lumpectomy because of the possibility of malignancy. This is just a small algorithm for the management of patients with nipple discharge. So a patient has nipple discharge, we evaluate her, we find a systemic cause, we manage it accordingly. Now suppose it appears to be a surgical case, you know, it's usually unilateral, spontaneous from a single or multiple duct. If there is a suspicious lesion, uh, either clinically or on mammography, they're going to excise that. And depending upon what we find, if it is breast cancer, obviously she's going to end up with an MRM or a breast conservation therapy. If there is no suspicious lesion, then we would like to you know, uh, either excise the entire central duct for patients with significant nipple discharge from multiple ducts. And otherwise, if you can find a single duct, uh, then it's a single lactiferous duct excision can be performed. With that, uh, we have a small take home message for all our delegates. Nipple discharge, though physiological in most cases, may warrant underlying malignancy in 7 to 13% of cases. Red flag cases include those with unilateral, single duct, bloody, or clear discharge with or without a lump. Callectography, ultrasound, and MRI play a key role in the diagnosis. Treatment depends on the underlying problem. Ductoscopy has largely benefited the evaluation and treatment of abnormal nipple discharge. Microdocectomy is the surgical excision of a duct in women with nipple discharge who wish to later breastfeed in the absence of malignancy. Friends, the breast is an integral part of a woman and hence every gynecologist must be well versed with managing breast diseases. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for a patient hearing. Excellent, Dr. Charu. Uh, very nicely, very elaborately, you explained about the conditions which causes nipple discharge and how to evaluate them. And we should not miss any opportunity to examine the patient who are coming with simple, simple problems regarding the breast. That is what I want to say here. Rest, uh, as the webinar will go on, we will uh, means study more things. We will discuss more things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Jaya Chaturvedi, ma'am. It was indeed a pleasure to have you as chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now once again, I move ahead with the program and uh, I would like to reshare my screen. But uh, again, give me a moment as I readjust. Kindly bear with me for a moment. I, uh, our next chairperson is uh, Dr. Meenu Vaish, ma'am, uh, Director and consultant, Meher, uh, consultant in Meher Hospital, Dehradun. Uh, she's at present uh, President Uttarakhand Society of OBGYN, immediate past President Gynec and Obstetric Society of Dehradun, uh, Medical Excellence Award by Dainik Chagran on Doctor's Day of, of this, uh, this year's July. She's been awarded the Medical Excellence Award by the Chief Minister of Uttarakhand. She has been presented with the Best Doctor Award by the Uttarakhand Mahila Association 2008. She has worked as the organizing secretary at Dehradun OBGYN Society. She has always been an active participant by, of many of the FOXI programs, including the Green Revolution program, has organized a large number of free medical camps in the city, has organized a laparoscopic myomectomy workshop in 2019, and has organized a large number of camps for prevention of breast cancer and cervical cancer under the Can Protect Foundation. Over to you, Dr. Veenu Vesh, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Charu, for the kind words. And first of all, I congratulate the Foxy Breast Committee for organizing such a beautiful webinar on the breast diseases along with Uttarakhand societies. And uh, I think that is the need of the time. As we all know, the car breast carcinoma is the most common cancer among women 
in U USA and now in India. Uh, it is the most common. Yesterday, Arti sent a slide, I think, for her this thing uh, talk. And uh, it is stated that it is the most common cancer uh, in India also. So this is a very good webinar you people have organized. And I congratulate doc Dr. Sneha Chairperson, Breast Committee, Foxy, and uh, Dr. Charulata, National Coordinator for Breast, Com uh, Breast uh, Committee, uh, Foxy, for uh, giving the opportunity to all the doctors of the of the all the gynecologists of Uttarakhand for having such a vast knowledge on on this subject. Uh, with the efforts of everyone, with the efforts of Uttarakhand societies, with the efforts of every each and uh, each and every gynecologist, and with the uh, members of the breast committee, we can do wonders and we can conquer breast cancer. As the president of the Uttarakhand societies, we are organizing camps, we are doing screening camps every month, and we are encouraging all the doctors in rural areas. Almora, Haldwani, every, every area for doing a screening test for carcinoma, cervix, and breast cancer. So together, we can definitely conquer the breast cancer. Now, as we all know, our next topic is evaluation of the breast lump. And the speaker is none other than our dear friend, Dr. Arti Luthra. Arti is a great friend, and she is the president of the Uttarakhand she is the president of the Dehradun Option Gaini Society. And uh, I need to have her uh, CV, please. Ma'am, thank you. I think no, we all know <laughs> each other so well. She is we doing can... wonderful work in the laparoscopy. Mm -hmm. She's a good friend. She's a very innovative uh, girl. Every time she comes out with a great idea. So thank whenever you. we plan something in Dehradun, we take her <laughs> advice. She's younger thank to you. us, but she is very innovative. So thank you. Thank you, Minu, ma'am, for your love and blessings. You know, it's uh, all your support and uh, you keep uh, appreciating us so much the, that we end up doing good work. Finally. Thank you. Arti is our uh, poster face. Pardon me? Arti is our poster face, you know. Come yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Sneha, once again uh, for... Um, having us all here. It's all because of your planning. It's so nice to see Dr. Mitra, Dr. Sarveshwari Nautyal, Dr. Mangla. And uh, I'll start sharing my screen. The topic which I'm going to uh, discuss is uh, evaluation of breast lump. We all come across breast lump cases in our OPD. And uh, each time we are so careful that what is the right management for this particular patient. So uh, my first two, three slides will be on breast cancer. Then we'll move on to breast lump. Why? Because the main purpose of uh, evaluation of breast lump is First of all, we help the woman in agony, like if she has an abscess or an infected lump. At the same time, we don't miss any malignant lesion, which, you know, uh, can lead them to a further stage if the diagnosis is delayed. So uh, breast cancer accounts for 14% of cancers in Indian women. And breast cancer mortality rate in India are 1.7 times higher than maternal mortality rate. This is one figure which is shocking. Last night, I was sitting in the OT and reading it to everyone that breast cancer mortality can be higher than maternal mortality. It, it tells us that, you know, our maternal care is improving at the same time our lifestyle changes are increasing the risk of breast cancer amongst women as well as men. Collectively, US, India, and China account for almost one third of the global breast cancer cases. And about one in 28 Indian women are expected to develop breast cancer during their lifetime. So screening, for breast cancer, awareness about breast self-examination is as important as pap smear and routine health checkups. 
if we look at this diagram, the, the first diagram which shows the breast cancer incidence, and this is a 2018 figure which shows that total number of breast cancer cases were 1,62,468. That is 27.7% of all women having cancers. The highest number was breast cancer. And the total number of cases were 5,87,249. That's a pretty big number. Breast cancer, 27%. Cancer cervix, 16.5%. Thanks to our screening programs. Ovarian cancer, 6.2%. We need to educate our women more. And then lip oral cavity cancer, 4.8%. And other cancers in total, were 35 percent. This is the incidence. And now when we look at the mortality, again, breast cancer takes the lead. Out of these women, 371,302 women died and 87,090 deaths were due to cancer breast. 23 percent of all deaths in 2018, which were cancer related, the maximum number was solely due to cancer breast, followed by cancer cervix, 16.2% of all cancer related deaths, and ovarian cancer again, 6.5%. So we really need to be very careful sitting in our OPD, working in our OTs, that we don't miss educating as well as screening about these cancers to all women, all young girls. So what are the risk factors for breast cancer? The risk factors for breast cancer are modifiable risk factors, which can be modified by lifestyle and risk factors which are non-modifiable or uncontrolled. We can just be aware of them and screen them. So the non-modifiable risk factors are gender. Women are having a higher incidence as compared to men, but of course, breast cancer is seen in men also. Age. Incidence increases after the age of 40. Genetic factors. 5 to 10% of cases are hereditary. And if a lady has a family history of CA breast in mother or sister, she's at high risk. Even if there is family history of CA breast in brother, or father, again, she's at high risk and she has to be more careful for regular screening. Early menarche before the age of 12 years and late menopause after the age of 50 years of age, again, puts a lady in high risk category, which is non-modifiable. Any family history of any type of cancer is a non-modifiable risk factor. If there is history of radiation therapy in chest area, especially at a younger age of around 30, the risk of CA breast is higher. Having no children increases the risk of having CA breast or giving birth to children at an older age, like after the age of 45 years or more, again puts a woman a lady in higher risk category, not breastfeeding at all, or ve very few weeks of breastfeeding after childbirth, again, puts you in the higher risk category. History of use of hormone replacement therapy to treat menopausal symptoms, again, puts a lady in high risk. Eating a lot of processed and fatty food, using hormone containing birth control pills, sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise and obesity, particularly after menopause is again a high risk factor for development of breast cancer. The modifiable and controllable risk factors uh, causing breast cancer are if one is exercising regularly, one is physically active, one is maintaining her uh, weight within the normal range and uh, less intake of alcohol and smoking, one is at lower risk of, and by changing these things, we can decrease the risk of uh, developing CA breast. So when should a lady consult a doctor? The most important uh, symptoms of breast cancer is a mass or lump in the breast. Uh, 
So if a lady uh, palpates or feels a hard mass, she must meet the clinician. Or if there is any change in breast or nipple appearance, there is unexplained change in the shape or size of breast, or there are areas of puckering or shrinkage of breast, if there is unexplained swelling of breast, especially unilateral, or if she notices a recent unevenness of the breast, she must go to a clinician uh, for examination. This is a very nice diagram uh, for the clinicians to, which depicts the common signs of breast cancers. There could be lumps, there could be nipple discharge, there could be dimpling of skin, there could be breast pain, there could be nipple retraction or erosion. There may be local redness of skin. There may be change of skin's texture like pudy orange or shrinking. One may feel the lymph nodes or one may notice a well-defined swelling. So any of these complaints in the OPD or examination findings, one should get alert and uh, the way Dr. Charulata said, the red flag signs with your antennae up that we should not be missing a malignant lesion. So why, you know, like when ma'am asked me, oh, oh, Arti, would you like to talk on breast lump? I was so happy because this is such an important topic. Breast lump, although most of them would be benign, but whenever you think of breast lump or whenever a patient comes to you, there is a doubt of cancer breast in a lady with breast lump. And uh, thinking that most of these are benign, we should not ignore the need for proper evaluation of any breast lesion. Basic breast anatomy, as we have discussed in the previous talk by Dr. Charulata also, we have to understand that breast has uh, about 15 to 20 uh, these glandular lobules and lactiferous ducts and there is a lot of fatty tissue and the breast is resting on the pectoralis muscles. So whenever uh, there is a malignant lesion, you know, uh, there is puckering around the breast tissue. I'm going to mention the key questions which are very important whenever we come across a woman with complaints of breast mass. So we should find out that for how long she has noticed this mass and is there any change in the size of this mass related to menstrual periods or if this mass uh, does not change at all and it is just gradually increasing in size and when was it noticed first and does she feel any lump in her axilla also? We have to elicit the history of any trauma to the breast. And we have to ask about history of previous surgical procedure like uh, abscess drainage or removal of fibroadenoma earlier. We have to ask about the personal history of breast cancer and family history again is very, very important. If there's any family history of CA breast, ovary or colon and what is the patient's ethnicity. And after history taking, the examination of breast mass is very, very significant. One has to examine the location, consistency, and size of the mass. And uh, we have to check for the nipple discharge. And we have to look for any associated mass on the other side, axilla, or in supraclavicular lesion. So now the question comes to the mind, what are the tests for early detection? So the most easy thing which we can educate to all is breast self-examination. All women above the age of 20 years, uh, they should look for early signs of breast mass. This should not be breast cancer. This should be any breast mass or nipple discharge. And we have to educate women different positions in which they have to palpate for the breast mass. Like first, they have to be standing in front of the mirror and look at the symmetry of both the breasts. There should not be any puckering of the skin or uh, the nipple should not be inverted. And then they have to put their pectoralis muscles taut by clinching the hands either in front of the chin or above the head 
and when the muscles are uh, made tight they have to see if there is any adhesion and one of the breast looks asymmetrical the examination is standing as well as lying position is very important both the positions are to be explained and uh, the examination has to be done in a circular manner in a transverse manner manner from lateral to medial and from top to bottom so that and it is very important to explain to them that the examination has to be done by the pulp of middle three fingers the flat surface so that they don't hold the fat and they get mistaken for any lump breast self examination if the lady has any doubt then the examination has to be done by the clinician so bsc followed by cbe clinical breast examination first of all the clinician has to inspect both the breast properly just to look for any abnormal signs in the shape over the skin and nipple and uh, clinical breast examination is recommended for all women once a year after after the age of 30 years and it can detect up to 44% of cancers of which up to 29% would have been missed by mammography the smaller ones so cbe has great importance and on uh, physic for physical examination the lady should be nicely exposed from waist above and it has to be done both in supine and sitting position it's very very important because a lot of times in the opd due to paucity of time we'll make the patient sit quickly examine the breast and we can tell her all looks good so let her lie down because in lying down position we can see the lateral part we can feel the lateral part of the breast more clearly and the lower part also another important thing is that we have to if we find any positive finding we have to document it with figures different findings like inversion of nipple retraction or destruction of skin overlying the nipple and retraction and tethering of skin edema inflammation ulceration you know after examining everything uh and we have to palpate for the lymph nodes especially in the supraclavicular area and in the infraclavicular area we have to palpate for uh axillary lymph nodes and then they have to be charted i'm going to show you the chart how to note down the breast lesion so <clears throat> this i have already told you that bsc has to be done every month preferably in the post menstrual phase uh, and a post menopausal lady can do it on a fine day every month like she can decide like first week of every month i'm going to check my breasts and the goals of breast self examination and clinical breast examination are to exclude malignancy and to provide a proper diagnosis and we have to see that all lumps are to be proven benign before deciding to be observe them like if on examination we feel that a big lump looks benign we have to confirm the findings by imaging so when a lady presents with a breast lump the differential diagnosis which comes to a clinician's mind could be it could be a malignant lump if it is hard irregular and painless it could be a breast abscess which we are going to discuss in the next talk there can be fibrocystic changes in the breast in the form of lumpiness thickening and swelling which can often be associated with a lady's periods there could be fibroadenomas in the form of a solid round rubbery lump uh, that moves under the skin when touched commonly known as breast mouse which occurs more often in young women there could be infections leading the breast to feel red warm tender and lumpy or there can be history of trauma leading to a bruise and traumatic fat necrosis giving the appearance of a lump so the first crucial step would be to feel the mass and uh, we have to assess the size with definable borders and we have to distinct it from the surrounding uh, tissue and uh, we have to see the age this we have already discussed there is repetition of slides but uh, i have already discussed that with increasing age the benign breast problems are less frequent and by the age of 70 more than 3/4 of masses breast masses would be malignant 
So the documentation has to be done on this kind of chart in which we have to review the patient's history. And if there is a personal or family history of breast cancer and there is occurrence of nipple discharge. And then on visual examination, the condition of the skin and nipples has to be noted down. And on physical examination, if we are feeling any lymph nodes on right and left side, and we have to mention about the scars, nodularity, nodes, and dimpling. And on this form, we have to see whether the breast findings, they seem normal to us, benign, or probably benign, or there is a definitive malignant looking mass for which the patient needs to be referred immediately to an onco specialist. All palpable lesions, because as uh, Dr. Charu has discussed, uh, the triple test is the key to diagnosis. So first is inspection, and then we have to do imaging, and then we have to do the pathology. So you feel the lesion, you do the imaging, you do the biopsy, and then we can see what type of lesion it is. And for imaging of breast lesions, we know that mammography is the standard of care for clinical abnormality in more than 30 years of age. And it should be done even if we have a strong clinical suspicion of malignancy. And it has to be done by a dedicated radiologist with proper uh, biorates grading and the indications as uh, we all know a palpable mass symptomatic males for screening purposes if there is axillary lymphadenopathy with normal clinical breast examination and if there are skin changes so on mammography we can see the shape of the mass whether it is irregular nodular how are the margins whether they are speculated or micronodular calcifications can be seen. We can see the architectural design of the uh, mass. Like in these images, we can see that uh, from left to right, this is a round uh, mass, this is an oval mass, and this is an irregular mass. The last one, irregular mass, gives us a high probability of malignancy. It's very important for all of us to go through breast imaging reporting and data system criteria whenever we are assessing a breast lump. And this is a very simple chart uh, being reported by all uh, radiologists sending mammography report, which gives us idea about the management of the diseases. So category zero means we need additional imaging or uh, prior examinations because we are not sure about the likelihood of cancer. So if it's by rates zero category, we have to supplement it with another test like uh, sonomammography or MRI if needed. Category one is negative. That means routine screening is enough and the likelihood of cancer is 0%. Category two is benign with 0% likelihood of cancer. Category three is also probably benign, but the lady needs to uh, remain under short interval follow-up every six months. And the uh, likelihood of developing cancer is between zero to two percent only. Category four is suspicious where we need to do tissue diagnosis. And category four has four ABC category, low suspicion, moderate suspicion for malignancy and high suspicion for malignancy. So we have to do tissue diagnosis in category four cases and category five is highly suggestive of malignancy. And on tissue diagnosis, the possibility of malignancy is more than 95% and category six are known biopsy proven uh, cases for malignancy. The sensitivity of diagnostic mammography is 90% and the specificity is 88%. So it is a very good, simple imaging test, which gives us a lot of information about the breast lesion. Nowadays, most of us are getting reporting of digital mammography, which gives us better image quality with fewer artifacts and fewer patient recalls. The advantage of digital mammography is that these digital images can be shared with other specialists for telemammography reporting also. And we can actually magnify these digital images and see the lesion very clearly. Like this slide shows, this is a 
2D form of mammography where we are not exactly able to localize the lesion but in in the same patient when we when we sent her for 3d mammography we can magnify the lesion and we can clearly see the irregular speculated pattern which is highly suspicious of malignancy i'll quickly go through the factors affecting the sensitivity of mammography its age breast density hormone therapy uh, in lobular carcinoma sometimes it may not give us a very good report and uh, high bmi patients they with increased density of breast sometimes may not show very uh, clear lesions on, uh, on mammography so this is very important the breast cancer screening guidelines for women with average risk because, because most of the times the lady would ask now my report is normal how often do you want me to go for mammography again so in a lady who's around 40 years you know she uh, can have the opportunity to begin screening but in a lady with 45 years uh as per american cancer society they should be having annual mammograms and in a lady who's 55 years and above it can be done on alternate years and uh the lady may continue with annual mammography if there is significant family or genetic factor and in ages 55 plus uh the lady can have regular mammograms as long as she is in good health so you know this i have already dealt that imaging ultrasound detects uh, all lesions very clearly but the sonologist has to be meticulous and skillful in diagnosis the lesions uh, the features which are suggestive of malignancy on ultrasound are speculations lesions with thick halos angular margins and acoustic shadowing so uh, these are few images uh, like this is the image of a cyst and this is the image of a typical fibroadenoma with well defined capsule and homogeneous internal echos and uh, this is clearly a benign lesion and this lesion shows posterior acoustic enhancement also so it is a valuable tool in assessing breast masses and ultrasound is less expensive and it can accurately differentiate a solid mass from a cystic one and specificity of ultrasound in detecting cystic cystic lesions is as high as 98% and it is the test of choice in younger women with denser breast tissue so most of the times below 30 years we want to get an ultrasound done and uh, mri is needed only in few cases uh, for uh, confirming the you know the kind of mass like if there is an equivocal mammogram and ultrasound report then we have to ask for mri and sometimes if there is axillary node malignancy with unknown primary site the lady has to be referred for mri and for the staging of disease and for finding multi centric disease mri is helpful i'll quickly cover these newer modalities in breast cancer diagnosis which are highly sensitive like breast scintigraphy in which technetium 99 uptake shows the lesion very clear uh, clearly and its sensitivity is much higher than regular mammography volumetric breast ultrasound is again helpful in in screening for occult cancers in women with dense fibroglandular breast and with an elevated risk of ca breast and it is very useful for imaging evaluation of non palpable masses in low risk women so the you know rather than sonomammography volumetric breast ultrasound is more sensitive and sono elastography is again a great tool in uh, picking up the masses with high sensitivity now we quickly come to pathology once we have picked up you know we have done uh, the lady comes with self examination uh, clinical examination is done the imaging is done now we have to confirm the kind of tissue for that uh, we have to take a pathology sample and the options available are fnac core biopsy or true cut biopsy we can do vacuum assisted biopsy incisional and excisional biopsy 
FNAC is a great tool because it can be done in the OPD. It can distinguish benign from malignant lesions. But nowadays, like my test of choice would be core biopsy. Why? Because FNAC does not show histological architecture and it cannot differentiate ductal carcinoma in situ from invasive malignancy. And uh, the only advantage is that it can be done quickly in the OPD setting at the same time and it, it is available at most of the centers. But true cut needle biopsy, you know, it has low false negative rates and it does not specially, it does not need specially trained cytopathologist for reporting. We can ed uh, obtain adequate samples and true cut biopsy also differentiates in in situ versus invasive lesions and it can confirm the receptor status also. And it is done by using or a true cut needle. So if you get a call from your sonologist that I'm finding a suspicious lesion, ask for true cut biopsy rather than FNAC with specificity of 85 to 100%, sensitivity of 80 to 95%, and multiple codes improve the sensitivity from around 81% to 95 to 100%. And it's again, not a very cumbersome procedure. Vacuum assisted biopsy gets bigger chunks of tissues and it has a small rotator which gets a good um, sample of tissue, but uh, it is more expensive and it is not easily available at all the centers. And last is excisional biopsy. If the lesion is big and it is increasing in size, it you know, we can take one excisional biopsy with wide excision after proper pre-op counseling and we can get a proper biopsy uh, done. The only thing is that it requires OT setup. It requires good analgesia and sometimes little sedation also because the procedure takes longer time. So this table shows the summary of breast biopsy techniques, which I have already discussed, FNAC, core needle and excisional biopsy. So finally, when I was talking to Dr. Sneha yesterday also, ma'am said, Aarti, we have to put stress on triple assessment, triple test, clinical assessment, imaging, and pathology. In clinical age, examination, imaging, ultrasound, mammography, pathology, either FNAC or core cut biopsy. And this can give us a confident diagnosis in 95% cases of breast lump and we can give them a clear cut line about the direction of treatment. So when adequately performed with the three components, the diagnostic accuracy can be as good as up to 100%. And more than 95% of palpable malignant breast lesions can be diagnosed in this way. For benign diseases, most large series report a false negative rate of only 0.1 to 0.7%. And the false positive report is only 0.4%. So this I have already discussed that uh, when a mass is subjected to mammography, so once it is visualized, it, it is benign looking on ultrasound, you know, uh, we can wait and watch. And if it is suspicious, we can send the lady for core biopsy. And if it is uh, not visualized clearly, we can do FNAC. And if the FNAC sample is uh, adequate, we have to treat appropriately. And if core biopsy is showing atypia or discordant uh, sample, then we have to get excisional biopsy done. And if it is a simple cyst, we have to observe. Complex cyst has to be aspirated. And of course, for solid mass, which is highly suspicion of malignancy, uh, we have to treat, which I'm going to discuss in the uh, next slide. So this is the, uh, you know, a quick uh, summary of age group wise distribution of breast lump. Like if a lady less than 25 years presents with the Mobile lump, the possibility is fibroadenoma. Ill-defined lumps are uncommon uh, in younger women and firm lump with tethering is also uncommon. But if it is there, we have to go for tissue diagnosis. A lady between 25 to 35 years, mobile lump, fibroadenoma, 
ill defined lumps mostly they have fibrocystic changes at this age or there may be sclerosing adenosis but if there is a firm lump with tethering uh, high suspicion of carcinoma and i would like to mention that sometimes we have seen younger patients having severe breast i had one patient who had just delivered and she came with breast lump and she came out to be malignant with two months old baby she went for the um, proper treatment of severe breast so um, and older age the suspicion of carcinoma is higher and mobile lumps could be either phylloidous tumor or fibroadenoma ma'am i'll just take 3 uh, minutes more because i know the time is time is running yeah, down running yeah Please. डिस्कस्ड so the take home message would be that you know one has to be aware about the breast lumps and make others also aware monthly self breast examination regular screening lifestyle modification the doctor should be consulted immediately if there is something doubtful palpated on in breast and triple test is the mainstay of diagnosis and lifestyle i have already discussed weight control alcohol smoking to be limited breastfeeding physical activity avoid hormone therapy and avoid radiation exposure if possible because early detection saves life lastly i would like to give a message that you know life is not about waiting for the storm to pass it's about learning to dance in the rain so if you come across some patient give them lot of positivity and hope and thank you so much i'll stop sharing my screen thank you aarti for a such a detail and elaborate discussion on the uh, breast lump and we really know that breast lump needs medical attention we cannot miss even a single case of breast carcinoma of breast so we have to be very particular we all have emphasized on the triple Uh, diagnostic uh, factor this is very important physical examination and then imaging test and then biopsy everyone has <laughs> talked about it dr charulata dr arti and dr sneha is talking about it so it's very important and arti has very well explained everything as far as the mammography is con con concerned is the imaging part whenever there is a suspicion we have to get alert and what are the sign of suspicion arti has explained but i like to add few things if there is a micro circulation if there is a clustered circulation there is a little calcification around the breast tissue then we should take it seriously and we should go for biopsy a uh, very important part, part rt has told that the core biopsy is better snc we can do in the outdoor but the uh, core biopsy is better but for for this we need to have expertise in that field so radiologists which has got training in breast imaging should do this otherwise very we can easily miss and the third part which i i will like to add whenever we do the cervical this thing sorry breast uh, tissue biopsy uh if there is a blood coming if there is a there is no change in the mass of the tissue we should not take it like we should not take it lightly we should surgical intervention is needed so uh and whenever there is a blood we have to be very careful so for the evaluation of the breast lump rt has very well evaluated rt has very well explained we need gynecologists we need a team of the doctors gynecologists radiologists oncologists and surgeons so uh, so we all uh, gynecologists need to work for screening part of the breast cancer and uh, certain, we have found that the by evaluating 100 lumps we we diagnose one or two cases of the carcinoma cancer so i am really thankful to dr sneha dr charulata and the all the speakers and dr uh, jaya dr aarti Uh, for such a wonderful uh, topic uh, they have chosen and they have given information to all the doctors of uttarakhand thank you all uh, good to see dr manisha uh, 
डॉक्टर मित्रा डॉक्टर वनीता थैंक यू एवरी वन फॉर द नाइस वेबिनार थैंक यू वेरी मच तो थैंक यू सो मच विथ दैट वी मूव अहेड इज माई स्क्रीन विजिबल Yes, Charu. We need to be precise, very crisp, and I think we request the speaker also to stick to the time. So let us invite our next chairperson, Dr. Archana Singh, Madam, um, who is uh, from Kanpur and Allahabad. She is a gold medalist. Uh, she has done her ultrasound course. She is the senior consultant obstetrician and gynecologist, laparoscopic surgeon at Siddhi Vinayak Hospital, Haldwani, and is the secretary of Haldwani OBGYN Society. Secretary, Uttarakhand Society of OBGYN. Madam, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I would uh, thank the organizers, Dr. Arti, Dr. Charulata, Dr. Uh, Sneha, ma'am, for inviting me for this esteemed webinar. So, uh, I'm supposed to introduce Dr. Mangla Wani. Uh, who is uh, obstetrician and gynecologist and lactation consultant specially and she is a director at hirkani gynecology and breastfeeding medicine clinic <laughs> president breastfeeding promotion network of india then uh, she is treasurer msr maharashtra chapter iscr 2014 to 16 clinical secretary pogs since 2018 to 19 and post director IB CLC lactation training from BPNI Maharashtra 2020 to 21. She is national trainer for IYCF. She is Indian Achievers Award for Chikitsak Ratan by Global Society for Health and Education Growth, New Delhi 2011. She has a Young Scientist Award at the Fifth World Congress on Endometriosis, uh, Yokohama, Japan, in 1996, and the Best Dividend Award, POGS 2010 to 11. Uh, another, she has a, so many awards to her. The Mantri Award on 2018, then N B Kumta, Dr. N B Kumta Award by B P N I Maharashtra 2021. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Arachana, for this your kind words and wonderful presentation. I think we are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I will just start the sharing screen first and start talking at the same time. I'll just stop my sharing. You need to. Ah, yeah. You stop your sharing first, and then let me see if I can do. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Oh, uh, not no. yet. It's a plain screen. It is no. a plain screen. Yeah, we cannot see it really. Okay. Is your PPT open over there? Yeah, it's a PPT, and there are some videos, and that is why I thought if I share myself, it is better. Now, correct. Not no. really. It's not it's open yet. Uh, Still not see. No, no, no. no. Oh. Although she, it says that you are viewing uh, Mangla Wani's screen, screen, but, uh, but uh, it's only wide screen there. Now, yes, yeah, and now it is visible. Yes, make it uh, yes. slideshow, Mangla. Sorry, make it slideshow. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you, Sneha, so much for inviting me, Sneha, Charu, um, and uh, Arti, Madam, and Minu. Uh, Uttarakhand societies and for the kind words by Dr. P K Shah sir and Parag Biniwale and you feel nice you feel motivated to do more work you know when um, people understand what type of work uh, the Sneha and myself and Charu we are doing so this is now very uh, important topic the breast abscess and certain uh, little little breastfeeding technique also I will. I'll be talking, but I'm going to go a little bit faster because we have a panel discussion going on at the end. You know, so you know the breastfeed now from the breast diseases we are coming to breastfeeding, and breastfeeding rates are very suboptimal in India. So only three out of five newborns 
they don't get to begin breastfeeding within one hour. That is the recommendation by the UNICEF and WHO. Only 50% exclusively breastfeed for six months. And also the formula companies, huge business, more than 40 million uh, Indian rupees. So you can imagine. So we understand the breastfeeding rates are very, very low. And the first 1,000 days in the baby's life, which also includes the nine months in mother's stomach. And they're so important for the baby's brain growth, for baby's general health. And if that nutrition is not proper, it has a very damaging effect on the baby and irreversible impact for the whole life of the baby. And it is not only the baby's life, even the mother's uh, uh, life is gets affected. The mother has so many disadvantages of not breastfeeding. So the baby grows taller, has a higher IQ because of the proper brain development, has a stronger immune system. Cognitively, it is better. Socially, it is better. And even non-communicable diseases, um, they are protected, the babies. And even the mothers, as we said in the earlier topic. Now there are so many breastfeeding policies and in that one of that is mother says that I got fever or I got lump and I can't right. breastfeed and we can actually overcome in so many of these problems so many challenges and we can continue the breastfeeding now I'm going to talk a little bit about mastitis because before breast abscess the mastitis is there and it is important that we treat the mastitis properly and we can actually prevent the abscess happening so mastitis is inflammation, there is a fever and there is a redness and the swelling and the breast abscess is the localized collection of the pus within the breast. So globally, the researcher says that the, it is 20% of the cases the mastitis could happen. And usually they happen in earlier stage, in the first nine months. You know, so if, uh, it's the typical symptoms of mastitis, the redness of the breast or tissue, the pain, the, it is hot, you know, and there appears to be continuum of from engorgement to non-infective mastitis to infective mastitis and to breast abscess. So friends, you must be understanding that when the woman is in the hospital and she has the breastfeeding difficulties, and then she gets the engorgement. So Dr. Sneha Buyar very cleverly, she has mentioned that to me, you should mention about the breastfeeding techniques also, because these are the ones we need to look at in the hospital. And if the position is proper, if the technique is proper, we can prevent so many breastfeeding problems in the future. So the predisposing factors, damage nipple because of the improper positioning, infrequent feeding, poor attachment, use of pacifier or even artificial teeth. If you see this below second picture, I see very many times in the other hospitals that they put the nipple shield in the baby's mouth and then they put the formula with the syringe through that nipple shield. You know, even sometimes mother is ill, oversupply of the milk, rapid weaning for some reason. And the pressure on the breast with the tight closings or there is a white spot on the nipple or black nipple pore maternal stress and our Indian tradition, you know, this massage wali bai, and they do a lot of breast massage. And believe me, that actually traumatizes the breast tissue and it can start the process of mastitis and end with the breast abscess. So I tell my mothers not to get touched by those massage wali bais to at least to their breast, you know. And so improve, uh, we, have, we can prevent this. So improved understanding of breastfeeding management. And so routine measures, they should be in the maternity hospitals. We should effectively manage the breast fullness, engorgement, milk stasis, any difficulties, control of the infection. Now with the mastitis also, mother can continue to breastfeed. Very, very important. In fact, the continued breastfeeding will avoid the engorgement and it will facilitate the vascular and lymphatic drainage, which is important part. So again, the treatment of mastitis, frequent and effective milk removal, and then some analgesia and some antibiotics. 
Now attachment, the four points, everybody should know how the baby latches at the breast. So baby should do maximum R and the maximum areola should be in the baby's mouth and the lower lip turned outwards and the baby's chin touches the breast. That means the baby's head is extended. So the chin is touching the breast, automatically nose and the head goes away from the breast. So if you see the lower uh, left picture, it is a proper attachment. And on the right side, you see that this baby is taking only the nipple. So with the baby holding only the nipple, there is a nipple trauma and then it starts the chain of all those pathologies. So with the proper attachment, the nipple is way inside near the baby's palate. And so it is very comfortable, the breastfeeding and very less likely to get the nipple trauma. Now, how should, now this is the clinic. Uh, this thing, video, you can see this mother has come that the baby is not latching properly and she is having a lot of problems and the baby is on the formula. But with little help, uh, sorry. So, so with the little help, you can see from this picture and now that what we changed, that the baby is completely turned towards the mother. Mother and the baby, they are close to each other. And the way the cross cradle position, the baby is been hold by the mother. So how the baby nicely latching. So these are the small, small things. If the gynec obstetricians, we can learn, definitely we can teach our moms or when we are doing the round, in five, 10 minutes, we can see what is going on because nine months we are looking after the mother. So they have more trust in ours, ourselves. So they, they listen to us rather than listening to the third person. So if we have the knowledge that can make a lot of difference in the success of the breastfeeding for that particular mother and baby diet. So breastfeeding on demand eight to 10 times, whenever a baby is hungry, there is no restriction. So how you identify feeding cues, we have to tell. I think somebody is uh, not muted. So yeah, I request everybody to mute themselves. So whenever the baby opens the mouth or she starts leaking or tongue is outside, rooting at the breast or putting the fingers in the mouth, these are the early signs. So mother should put the baby to the breast that stage, not when the baby starts crying. The crying baby is very difficult to put at the breast. So as I said earlier, it is again no massage. Again, the hand expression can be done or it can be done by the breast pump. If it is too painful for the mother sometimes to breastfeed with the nipple trauma and then the uh, uh, this is that she's been using by the breast pump because she has an engorgement also here she is doing by the hand and this it is a technique which sometimes take two three hours just to teach the technique of the hand expression when we do this uh, uh, breastfeeding workshops in the maternity hospital and then the parents are you know uh, giving them uh, baby with the spoon even by cup the baby can take the express milk we don't have to use any uh, bottles or any uh, nipple shields for that. So breastfeeding reminds us of the universal truth of abundance. The more we give out, the more we are filled up. And that divine nourishment, the source from which we all draw is like a mother's breast, ever full and ever flowing. So always mother's milk is enough for baby, even for twins, it is enough. You know, so this is very, very important. So I said this earlier about and the antibiotics for mastitis has to be 10 to 14 days, not just for three days or five days. Now, this mother did not have a proper treatment. So she came back with red, swollen breast, fluctuant mass and sonography shows suspicious of breast sepsis. So here we come with the breast sepsis. Again, they are the similar, all the risk factors. It is a well-defined mass, very fluctuant lump. There is overlying iridema. Mother may have fever, but with my experience, for mastitis, they have a fever. But by the time the abscess forms, they don't have the fever. They could have the enlarged lymph nodes. And sometimes it can spontaneously drain the pus from the mass. So typically, the ultrasound picture can diagnose the breast abscess. 
and can the mother with breast abscess breastfeed this is again very very important issue many times we ask the mother to stop the breastfeeding and that could be very damaging because one thing actually it, the situation can become worse second thing the mother's milk supply goes down so even with the breast abscess we can continue the breastfeeding there is no harm even the research says even there is a pus coming out of nipple and that goes into baby's mouth it is not harmful but if the mother feels no with the pus no but at least she should express the milk and throw it off but yeah. that regular mm -hmm. removal of the milk from that breast mm -hmm. is very very important now we what do traditionally we do as soon as we know breast abscess the gynecologist we don't touch the patient now so far we are talking the breast is in the domain of our femininity and the gynecologist should treat so the breast abscess our woman has delivered we should able to deal with breast abscess and not to refer to the breast uh, the, to the surgeon and he typically does the incision and drainage many times we even the suppress the lactation so no friends please don't do that we don't do the incision and drainage anymore so what we do we just do the repeated needle aspirations that too in the outpatient clinic under local anesthesia i used to do it with the ultrasound control when the initially i was learning but now i don't need even the ultrasound guided needle and it is very easy with practice you can do because then it avoids the admission and then it avoids the separation and you know there is a so much pain you know one month five six weeks the dressing goes on and it is very painful and so with that needle aspiration the breastfeeding should be continued so antibiotics we have to give and repeated aspirations initial reports is what the science said ki less than 3 cm abscess you can do by incision and drainage but no nowadays with the larger abscess also we can continue the aspiration in us they do this with the ir catheter or and they keep it for 2 to 6 days or sometimes if it is larger they do the ultrasound guided percutaneous drainage you know how many times now there are different uh, opinions different papers so this paper was on 30 patients and they 50% required single but 34 required multiple aspirations to me again it depends on the size of the abscess because it is multi loculated and in one single sitting it is not possible to drain all the pus or the pus may form again and again so needle aspiration with ultrasound guidance is an effective treatment this is what this paper says in the us cohort <clears throat> they said the number of drainage procedures was two with 24% requiring five or more drainage procedures but in my clinic in pune so far we have done 71 cases in last two and half years and we have 68 successfully treated with alternate day aspirations and breastfeeding continued so we had 96% success with incision and drainage so you can see this above picture this is the abscess so we have been aspirated few times here and you know sometimes up from 50 ml i have even aspirated up to 200 ml at a time you know under local anesthesia sometimes it may not respond because of the thick pus resistant bacteria it could be tuberculosis sometimes it could be malignancy we should keep that in the mind i'm not going to show this so incision and drainage you know it is a prolonged healing time painful wound so we should avoid and we should avoid referring to the surgeon and we should do the aspiration now breastfeeding support is another very important so we don't have to suppress the lactation so suckling may be difficult due to wound and the dressing on the affected side when we do the incision and drainage but breast emptying and continuation of the breastfeeding is very easy when we do the aspiration because there is no wound on the breast you know if suppose the mother is still in pain she can express she can manually express she can express with the breast pump but she should continue the breastfeeding on the non affected side that is important the baby nursing at a mother's breast is an un 
undeniable affirmation of our rootedness in nature. You know? So breastfeeding never, never should stop after the uh, breast abscess aspiration. You don't give that milk to baby, but taking the milk out of the breast, either by manually expressing or by breast pump is very, very important. So we should not ask you don't breastfeed for three days because then she gets engorgement or sometimes the formula is given. Baby is happy with the formula and then refuses the breast. A lot of things they happen. So women with the needle aspiration group were more likely to continue the breastfeeding and breastfeeding cessation occurred in 41% of cases of breast abscess. So if we don't treat properly, there is a likelihood that the breastfeeding will stop and the woman actually can regret the whole life when she wanted to breastfeed and she could not, she was unable to. So it is where a lot of psychological trauma happened in the women. So the prevention of mastitis and breast abscess, lactation consultants has a very, very important role. You know, this IBCLC, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, that we take these courses every year from uh, behalf of the BPNI Maharashtra, and it is a master's course one year. So anybody who is interested, passionate can do this degree. So it helps, you know, this lactation consultant's role is very, very important. It is a supportive, counseling, and then it is a multidisciplinary approach. And breastfeeding preservative strategies and effective milk removal and a follow-up, they can all do that. So in Pune, as uh, Dr. Parag Biniwale said, we've been very active with our Pune OBGY Society. In the last four, five years, we are continuously doing the breastfeeding conference during the month of August, and we are going to do again uh, next year. This is the one what we did, the ramp walk of the mothers, breastfeeding mothers who had a lot of challenges, but they overcame their challenges and they continued the breastfeeding. So it is a lucky baby, I feel, who continues to nurse until he is two. So this is the recommendation by World Health Organization that the baby should be breastfed for minimum of two years. Minimum that two. And maximum as long as the mother and the baby wants. There are lots of myths and unnecessary. Even if the breastfeeding is going all right, you know, when the baby starts eating by 10 months, one year, we advise mother to stop the breastfeeding. So I think we should not do that. So working together, the multidisciplinary uh, thing is very, very important. So improved breastfeeding practices are an efficient way to prevent both milk stasis and spread of in, uh, infection, correct attachment, position of the baby is important. Lactation consultants, counselors have important role. And mother should know where to seek the help. Many times when mother has a problem at home, she doesn't know where to go. And if she goes to the health professional who doesn't have the experience, she would end up with cessation of the breastfeeding. So breastfeeding can continue in many challenges. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a nice and interactive session. Uh, I never knew that we had a degree for a lactation consultant also. Yes. Uh, yeah. there is. And anybody can contact me and we can enroll you for that course. And it is a very thorough, we deal with both theoretical and practical things as well. That's true that it's necessary to teach our patients how to breastfeed, how much to breastfeed, what yes. prevention is to be taken, how to take care of the breast. And that is, I think, one of the most important things which we should do uh, as a gynecologist and an obstetrician. Then uh, uh, we should not stop breastfeeding while uh, we have drained the acid. This is very true. And um, thank you so much, ma'am, for thank you. such a session. Thank you. Doctor thank Mata, you so I have much. a question. I have a question. Uh, a few patients come to our clinic. The patient yes. is 11. She has got an 11-month baby. And she yes. conceives again. And uh, she is feeding her uh, baby. And yeah. she, she is asking whether I should continue to uh, lactate my baby or not. Yes. So what, we, what normally you would say? 
Most yeah. of the time, I say yeah. gradually you have to wean off because no. it, can, it, it causes that is you what I say, you know, there are so many benefits not to the baby, to the mother as well that she gets protection from cancer of the breast, cancer of the ovaries, cancer of the uterus and even the non-communicable diseases like diabetes, heart problems, blood pressure, obesity, the mother is protected. Her bones are stronger. I know we can go on the benefits. So we have to tell the mother. The longer the breastfeeding, the more uh, benefits to both the baby and the mother. And the bonding that we cannot count in the financial terms, in the money saving money terms. So more and more is the better. But the minimum by the WHO is two years. So even if the baby is eating, that we call as a pura kahar, complementary feeding. So along with the breastfeeding, the complementary feeding will continue till the two years. After two years, maybe then slowly we can reduce the breastfeeding. But breastfeeding is beneficial. Our uh, ancient anthropological studies says our ancient babies were breastfed average 6.5 years. That's true, ma'am. And, that's you, and that now we have working mothers, nuclear families, formula. You know, that is why like we take conferences and we discuss all those things in detail. Because now, you know, I'm sure now Sneha is, mm, now my panel discussion is there, so we can't talk much. But there is so much to talk on those things. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, Mangala. That was indeed such a practical and informative talk. And now we come to the much awaited. Uh, thank you, Mangala. Uh, panel discussion, which is going to be conducted by none other than our breast committee chairperson, uh, Dr. Sneha Bhuyar, ma'am, who's a pillar of support and without whose untiring efforts today's webinar would not have been possible. She's a friend, philosopher, and guide who's received so many awards. And so without much ado, I would uh, hand over the dais to madam to introduce her uh, expert and her panelists. Over to you, Dr. Sneha, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Char Charu. Please uh, stop sharing so that I can share mine. I thought you had asked for well, this is the entire PPT. Uh, you okay. Want okay. So let's stop. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. You can just stop it. Um, I will introduce. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes you can see that. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so a warm welcome to all the esteemed panelists. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Ruchira Nautiar. Dr. Hello, Ruchira. Uh, yeah, sure. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, and I would like to welcome all the panelists. Uh, Dr. Banita Sahai, who is our um, member of the Breast Committee. Dr. Vanita. Good evening, Madam. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Anju Soni is chairperson, HIV and AIDS committee. Uh, has she joined? Charu? <clears throat> she was here, I think. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Adhika Raturi, yes. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Here. Uh, yes, yes. Hi, Anju. Hi. Uh, Dr. Radhika Raturi. Uh, Dr. Anupama Ravi Futela and Dr. Manisha Singh. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Dr. Mitra Saksana, uh, who is the chairperson of Practical Obstetric Committee, Foxy. Welcome, Dr. Mitra. And Dr. Yamini Kansal, who is an oncosurgeon. So we are very lucky to have, you know, all the spectrum of panelists rise from the purely obstetric to oncosurgeon. And of course, uh, chairpersons from Foxy who have also worked or shown interest in this, you know, Anju was with me um, competing for this post. So we welcome you, Anju, and now uh, heading the another committee. So with this uh, short uh, introduction, I would just like to go ahead uh, straight to the panel discussion. Before that, only one point, which I have already shared with you, that as Breast Committee, all of us are tackling these three issues. Mainly, uh, Gauri Taneja. 
Gauri Taneja, please mute yourself. अकेडमिक से publishing uh, newsletters updates and ready readiness for them and at the same time we are training the paramedics to perform clinical breast examination and uh, training them to teach the common people for self breast examination for the common people we are um, making public awareness uh, you know giving them informative booklets and pamphlets and we are making them aware about their own breast and self breast examination we teaching them so that's how we are working at all three levels the aim being all the time we are talking about that yes early detection saves lives and that's why our aim is not to miss the early breast cancer where the outcome is very very good so all of you will agree to me that breast is always the symbol of womanhood and ultimate fertility and may it be the disease or the treatment in the form of surgery they evoke the fear of mutilation and loss of femininity so we are here all of us to discuss the various concerns for breast so uh, dr banita this is a first case for you we have a young girl 20 year old who has come to you with complaints of painless lump in the right breast Uh, she has just noticed this few months back when you examine you find that there is a well circumscribed lump which is smooth and contour form consistency 2 by 2 cm only non tender very freely mobile not adherent to skin or the underlying structure uh, what is your probable diagnosis you can share your differentials as well does it need further investigation and what is the treatment for this particular patient thank you so much madam for giving us the opportunity some echo is there thank you so much you have any other uh, device open uh, vanita ma'am no no, no. Okay. okay you can go ahead no issue thank you so much sir that and anutrakhand society for giving me this opportunity to be to being a panelist among the esteemed panelist and the legend of are uh, present here as a chief guest dr p k sa sir and dr c n parandre sir and varag bini wala sir i show my gratitude to them it's a very important that a this lump of small 2 cm with uh, which is fluctuating under the skin and not attached to the lower uh, it is form lump and mostly it's not fluctuating dr banita it's not fluctuating it's it's oh. freely mobile oh freely mobile okay. yeah it's a freely mobile lump a form lump of small size in a young girl usually it in a reproductive age we probably find mostly as a fibroadenoma and it is the most common between 20 to 40 years but it can continue after it that also every year we find almost 1 million fibroadenoma in country and okay so do you want to confirm your diagnosis any investigations you want to go for well, we can confirm this diagnosis by clinical examination by investigation and in the clinical examination what we are going to do we will palpate it we will palpate all the axillary lymph node and even the infraclavicular supraclavicular lymph node we can palpate both the breast and then we go for the investigation is the we will find if there is any other lump or not and if there See, is another... we have already examined this the girl Okay. we have okay. these findings okay. and we will go for the investigation yes, madam yes. 
that yes. is uh, we will go for the ultrasound first if it is clear in ultrasound or it uh, we can uh, if it is doubtful in a little bit in ultrasound we can go for the mammography or digital mammography and for 20 20 year old girl when you find it is clinically almost almost 100 percent sure that it is fibroadenoma uh, Dr. Banita, I, I don't think we should go for any other investigations. This is a case of fibroadenoma, as you have said already. Now, my next question is, you have confirmed your diagnosis. We are happy with it. You, you have come to a diagnosis clinically, yes. All the characteristics going in favor of fibroadenoma. You have done ultrasonography just for confirmation and documentation that, yes, it is fibroadenoma and not something else. So, for this young girl, single fibroadenoma, two by two centimeter, what would be your plan of management? Whether you want her to wait or you want to remove? It, it can be non-surgical or it can be surgical. In okay. non-surgical, we can uh, we can just see whether uh, we can follow up the case, whether it is increasing in size or not. How long, just, how long uh, you want to follow? Her? And then we can go for the fibrin needle biopsy also so that we can find out if there is any abnormalities in the cells. So because some of the fibroadenoma, because of uh, its complexity can change to the carcinoma. So we can go for the fibrin needle biopsy, uh, biopsy. Mostly it is benign, but sometimes the uh, we find the different type of the fibroadenoma, which can be simple, juvenile one, which, uh, which can be complex one, fibroadenoma yes. or giant fibroadenoma. So, uh, yes, you're right, uh, Vanita. Just to uh, make you know the house aware of <clears throat> what are the recommendations. Basically, as you all know, that fibroadenoma is a purely benign tumor. It is a stromal and epithelial proliferation arising from the terminal duct globular unit. Malignant transformation is very, very rare. But yes, if you have giant fibroadenomas or complex fibroadenomas, fibroadenomas which are lasting after 35 years of age, these are the ones which necessitate excision. Okay, so for a young girl, 2 by 2 centimeter, we do not remove it. We just ask her, we convince her, counsel her that yes, it is a benign tumor. Only reassure her. And maybe six-monthly follow-up or yearly follow-up is all that is necessary. If it persists after 35 years of age, then only there is a question of removal. For two by two, even I, I don't think there is a place for medical. But yes, you have an option of medical treatment and that is Sevista, okay, or meloxifene. So this is how you're going to decide about the plan of management. So for our patient... 20-year-old, very small fibroadenoma, clear-cut single fibroadenoma. There is no need of excision, reassurance, and follow-up. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Banita. Uh, now, Dr. Anju, uh, this is a, a case for you. 35-year-old woman, which we are uh, facing such kind of cases day-to-day -day practice, is coming to you with a bilateral painful breast. And when you examine, you find, you know, typically she's telling you that, madam, before menses, it uh, worsens. And now uh, after the menses, she's relieved of that. So when you examine, you find that both the breasts are painful. When you are trying to examine, there's no lump. Though she's complaining of painful breast lump, there's no lump, but nodularity all around, especially at the upper and outer quadrant. Uh, Anju, uh, what is your diagnosis and how would you like to go ahead with the management? Uh, these are, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you for organizing this beautiful awareness program. And also I'd like to thank all the uh, persons present here, the uh, societies of Uttaranchal, Dehradun, Haridwar, Rurki, and uh, all the societies for, you know, their presence, because we really love to see each other. At least this way, we are able to see each other. Otherwise, we were not even, you know, with the COVID coming in, we were not even, we would have starved of seeing each other. So nice to be here with all of you. 
and uh, you know this is a condition which you have kept is i think one of the very common complaints with 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 which a patient comes to us and uh, you know it, uh, it these are the cases which are known as uh, fibroadenosis of the breast yeah or uh, fibroadenosis disease of the breast and uh, these are the patients which uh, you know how to diagnose we do a uh, clinical examination of breast and then we do an ultrasound and in ultrasound we can see those you know rice uh, kind of rice shaped small fibrotic areas uh, most of the cases the ultrasound is more than enough because uh, mammography is not required in uh, these cases as uh, these are the patients who will uh, who who are you know in their uh, who, who are having good endocrine in their systems so but only in the cases where uh, the patient is very obese or the breasts are too large we may require to uh, go for mammography now um, uh, i have covered your first two questions yes. now coming to the management uh, management you know there is a lot of dilemmas and debate over the treatment of this disease because we all know that it is uh, fibroneurosis is a term Where, which is a histological ch changes, uh, which are seen in the breast lump, which includes fibrosis, adenosis, microcyst, and epithelial hyperplasia. So these are the ch changes. Metaplasia. Yeah. So we uh, we need to be uh, you know sure that these will not get converted. Though most of the cases they they do not get converted into malignancy, but there it has been seen in many uh, scientific. Uh, you know studies that uh, these patients who are having more of fibroadenosis have slightly increased chance of breast malignancies per se so we must you know uh, in these cases do a fnac uh, and uh, you know treat them and we may we may in some cases we may require to do a biopsy uh, though it is not to be done in routinely and then uh, to show these patients that they, they do not have any problem per se and then uh, you know uh, coming to their uh, premenstrual part it is very very you know it is seen that this is uh, you know kind of associated with the premenstrual syndrome uh, which can be and which is which is because of the increased level of progesterone in the last part of your cycle yes and that can be managed very well by giving a See, uh, <clears throat> very well described anju only she has three issues the premenstrual pain the lumpish feeling and her uh, concern for malignant transformation which you have tackled very well yes there is a chance but 1.5 to 3% okay. and maybe after 35 years of age okay but then what about those two aspects pain and lump how do you manage this that's what i'm saying for the pain we need to Yeah, uh, give her these uh, drugs like you know which have uh, uh, vitamins and which are very helpful in uh, controlling the premenstrual syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. Telling them not to take caffeine and you know uh, because there is a fluid retention in these women in their premenstrual phase, which also uh, you know affects their uh, uh, their breast and which lead to pain and heaviness in the breast. Mm -hmm. so we have to tell them not to take lot of salt not to take uh, you know um, uh, uh, this caffeine and caffeine products and of course maintain healthy lifestyle and maintain good healthy weight because that is again very very important and we can give them vitamin e tablet prime rosa oil and uh, which and in some cases we may require to give them danosol which is though very in very very rare but we have to give that option open for us in case they do not respond to the other medical treatment then we may uh, give them dinosaur or tamoxifen uh, which i mean which is used very very rarely but they should we should have the knowledge that they are part of our armamentarium when it comes yes. to treatment of uh, yes. fibroadenosis of breast because i today morning i saw one girl she is a young girl of 20 a thin built girl and she had a fibroadenoma she was very worried about it and we had to move the fibroid you know but still her breast i mean like it feels that she genetically has the tendency of having fibroadenosis bilaterally in both the breast and she's she really worried about it and you know medical treatment is 
uh, not giving her a lot of benefit, uh, you know. So sometimes I may have to, she her, because her pain is not that much at the moment. But if it goes that high, I may have to put her on any of these drugs. Yes. So true. I so have, I very have, well covered. Yeah. And, and, and um, you... just one more second. Yes. I have one patient who has been taking dinosaur for last, she's now 45, she's been taking dinosaur off and on on her own because she's been going to from one doctor to another and she feels better with dinosaur. So there are few cases, though, though, though very, very rare, but they, mm -hmm. they do require, you know, this kind of treatment. Yes. So very rightly described, yes, chance of malignant transformation, very rare. About her lump, Mainly it is premenstrual because of water retention, the cystic spaces, they enlarge. And her pain, which you have to take care of in the form of hot fermentation, breast support, and of course, analgesic. May it be local analgesic gel or may it be analgesic tablet systematically. Now, what about the treatment? I'm sure all of us are using vitamin E, gamma linolenic acid, evening primrose oil, all these things. But Yes, there is a definite treatment where last two years we have been using the SCRF. Neha, I just want to add one thing. Yes, please. These are the cases, you know, which bring breast awareness in the woman. So they have to be, you know, they make the woman breast aware. So we, can, we tell them about yes. palpating the breast and, you know, so whenever a patient comes to us with premenstrual breast pain, we must... It's our duty to make them breast aware. This is one term which I wanted to so, say. So, uh, if it is a very small cyst that disappears on its own, it will look like this on ultrasound. But if it is a large cyst, more than 5 centimeters, if it is too tense, then maybe you have to aspirate it under ultrasound. That is a very rare, rare situation. So, when we are facing these uh, cases practically day in and day out, I, I think everybody has to be very, very clear. I don't think in the recent past, over the last 10 years, we have seen any cases, any patient who is using Thanazol because the side effects are very, very high. And they, the drugs like SCRMs, which are very, very cost effective and very helpful, are coming up. So we have to uh, go ahead and use these drugs, which are quite rewarding. So thank you so much, uh, Ardu, for covering the topic and the case very, very well. Uh, now we come uh, to Dr. Madam, can I, can I just say something? Hello? Sneha, ma'am? Please, please. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Dr. Ruchira, Actually, you're yeah, comment. Madam, yes. just you know, one thing, because I thought these two cases which we just discussed, they were our in and out cases which we are seeing. Actually, yes. there is an entity in physiology, Andy which is a n d i yes and the classification and the classification yeah. aberration in normal development and involution yes but that so is a theoretical I, aspect so yeah, we didn't want no, to include it we have a chart no, uh, yeah my my yeah. just uh, uh, point of contention here was for both the cases be it a fibroadenoma a small fibroadenoma in a young girl very alert conscious yes. and this kind of cyclical nostalgia Counseling is the key, madam, because mm, we know mm. the literature and the evidence also proves that none of these primosa, vitamin E and all this, they more or less work like a placebo. Yes. Of course, yes, uh, as long as... Management. Yes, yes, as long. So the patient also needs to be aware ki what exactly is happening in her breast, which is a part of the remodeling involution and physiology. So... Uh, that exactly. One... We are we are allowing the part, uh, panelists to discuss their views, to share their views. But the take home message is always a very very practical management for fibroadenomas. We have concluded saying that if it is only a complex fibroadenoma that is lasting after thirty five years of age, more than five centimeter, or um, giant fibroadenoma and complex fibroadenomas, the RTPR they are having. These are the only ones which need. Otherwise, young girl with small fibroadenomas, only reassurance yes. and follow. Yes. This was the conclusion for first case. And for second case, the conclusion was, of course, symptomatic management. Hot yes. fermentation, breast support, maybe analgesics, may it be just a local or systemic analgesics. And then, of course, lifestyle modification. 
in certain cases you may need to use what empirical drugs we have been using they are See, quite rewarding so, so we can use yes, them but yes. SCRMs yes some definitely yes, have some definitely. place and that is how we want to continue so now we yes, go ahead with this third case thank you Dr. Ruchira um, Dr. Anupama this is a case for you we have a primary delivered five days back and now she comes to you with fever, which is overfilled, tight breast. The nipple areola is nipple is stretched out. The areola is shiny like this. When you try to press it, you know the express the milk. It is not flowing. What is your diagnosis? What has led to this condition? You have heard. I'm sure. See, purposefully we have taken this panel discussion after the talks so that you have you are already sensitized. And this is just a revision for you. So I want to know what is your diagnosis and management for this case. Good evening, Sneha ma'am. And uh, thank you, organizers, especially Dr. Aarti, Dr. Charu, and uh, Dr. Manjula uh, for inviting me here. And uh, Sneha ma'am, uh, uh, this is a very, very common, uh, doctor, after Dr. Manjula's uh, case presentation, we know that uh, she has de in detail discussed about mastitis and how to go about in the postpartum period. But just uh, for a very good revision, uh, I wanted to add that you have shown a picture here in which the, uh, the nipple area is uh, too engorged and too taken up. So in this situation, basically it is the engorged breast, which is probably not letting the baby catch up the latching is not happening properly. So probably the cause could be uh, some uh, blockage is there. And secondary to that blockage, probably the milk engorgement is occurring. And because of that engorgement, the baby is not latching up properly. And it's the... vice versa. It's vice versa. Either the baby has not latched initially properly, and that has led to this condition. And yes. now, again, because this has become so engorged, so engorged. that it's becoming difficult for the baby. So to latch what, on what will be your ideal way? How? What has if, led if to this If this situation condition? persists, then ultimately, if in, in this situation, the chances of, due to stasis, the chances of infection is also increased. So in this mm -hmm. case, if the fever is there, more than 100.4, then yeah, we, the chances... We, we go ahead with fever uh, later on. We tackle the engorgement first. Okay. So if there is engorgement, we have to first make the breast softer. So for that, we'll first let the milk be out by some way or the other. It can be a manual compression or it can be by a pump or it can be a relief with hot fermentation or good support. So uh, uh, by hook or by crook, we have to make the breast softer so that baby can latch upon it and do the breast sucking. Mind you, ma'am, uh, what I wanted to say is that I am a sufferer in all my kids. I've had this same problem. Maybe I had a bit of inverted nipples. That was the reason. I don't know what was the cause. But knowing that this can happen, it still happened every time. And uh, the best thing, the best suckling machine is the baby's mouth. And nothing is better than that. So for that, uh, the baby... I have a question for you here. Can a woman with inverted nipple or flat nipple breastfeed well? Uh, there is a I don't think it's, in, in it's the antenatal period, it is very mm -hmm. nice. If in antenatal period, towards the end, if you suckle it and take it out, and there is another way, uh, which my pediatrician told me, that uh, you take a syringe, invert it and pull it, so that, uh, and it, it, it has to be gradual, you know, you have mm -hmm. to do it over few weeks that it can change the shape of the... Uh, yes, just a little deviation from your uh, sentence. A woman with this kind of, both these kinds of nipple can breastfeed because the baby attaches to the breast and not to the nipple. nipple. And in fact, with the baby sucking, there is a formation of this shape, you know, the nipples get corrected because you know that you are just now you mentioned that baby's mouth is the best pump you have. So uh, very well said that, yes, maybe if, if at all you diagnose antenatally, actually it is not recommended to correct it. But yes, maybe during 
towards the end of ninth month when you have your delivery closer you can definitely correct it manually you can apply some lubricant and maybe just you know correct it maybe you can apply the syringe and push pull it pull. okay go ahead well that was about the uh, this is about the inverted nipple i guess but ultimately if you have this uh, presentation you have to after you have made the nipples softer and smaller the baby is able to latch on it and uh, get the know how on how to feed it it happens more frequently in the primary gravidas because you know they are not all that used to feeding the baby and they don't have the knack to uh, how to go about it on the first time so the chances that the baby would erode the nipple is more common in a primary patient um, and if there the nipples are sore in that situation the chances of cracked area being more common and the baby's mouth has usually the staph aureus generally it is the baby who lets the infection pass on so it is if the we crack want to give certain and... messages to uh, uh, dr anupama sorry to interrupt you we want to give certain messages to the uh, attendees why do the nipples crack why do the nipple stack because the latch is not proper the baby attaches to the nipple only and then sucks the nipple that's the very reason the nipple crack if the baby attaches properly to the breast the nipple and part of the areola should fit in then the cracks don't happen so that's how we are supposed to avoid the nipple cracks which ultimately leads to infection and engorgement and mastitis the vicious circle uh, starts it. okay so suppose you have this baby with the mother you have made the breast soft you have done hot fomentation now the mother is ready to feed so how would you proceed for this en uh, engorgement whether you would like to express the milk or put the baby no no you, the mother once she has taken out a bit of milk and the nipple is softer the baby can latch on it and then mm -hmm. that is going to be the best solution to her problem so uh, the, the mother can very well breastfeed she should know the proper technique she should be taught about it that how uh, yeah that is where the role of healthcare provider or worker or the family member comes in and that's the very reason as you all know this year we have protect breastfeeding a shared responsibility where we as obstetrician are supposed to share their responsibility and we are supposed to teach our staff as well as the family member to support the breastfeeding woman i, I have a suggestion be, yes i have please. a suggestion in my hospital there is one nurse who's dedicated to this job every day in the morning one of the mm -hmm. senior nurses it's a job before the patient's discharge or the day after her delivery she has to explain it in detail to the mother and to all the relatives the ladies around her how yeah. to go about it yes we we are insisting on every staff should know it and we should conduct even the antenatal session involving the family members so okay. very uh, very well uh, described dr anupama uh, only now the last question suppose the baby is not with the mother how would you go ahead we should take out the uh, uh, milk either manually or by pump manual mm -hmm. expression is done in the steps you have shown here the important thing to understand is that you should to start peripherally and then go towards the apex so that mm -hmm. is important because it's if you only press the nipple area then it will rather block and uh, the proper uh, pressure would not be there it has mm -hmm. to be little behind the black area so that is the way where you should uh, do the final compression effect in Correct. fact you can also go about with giving oxytocin to these mothers if uh, there is a desperate situation. i don't think there is any need of oxytocin because there is a oxytocin reflex once the baby suckles at the nipple suckles at the, the baby breast, is not sucking the nipple yes then yes situation. but the very fact that she is having milk that's a very reason she is having engorgement okay yes. so we have to just express it so either you do gent <clears throat> counseling gentle massage uh, hot compresses to relieve pain or hot water shower and then once you uh, express the breast milk then you can go for cold I, compresses i want to this... add something here uh, uh, that uh, breast pumps are also very very effective 
Mm-hmm. I okay now there is a slide on that mm-hmm. <laughs> the modern breast pumps you know which are the electrical ones uh, yeah. in my hospital most of the doctors who are you know working mothers and they have to go in and out even my own uh, gynecologist in my team so mm-hmm. all of them vouch for this breast pump and it is very very effective very close to nature uh, and better than manual company if the patient can afford it it's a worth investment in fact this was the gift that they my anesthetist got this <laughs> gift from me and she thanks me daily for this <laughs> okay so we have this various you know the patient is asking you now every rest everything she has understood well what will be the best position to feed can she feed in a side lying position well it's whether she she is worried position. whether the baby will be aspirated as whether the baby will aspirate well the position is more important for uh, uh, actually mm-hmm. it is the patient's comfort which is more important some people would like the side cradle some with the straight cradle some would say that they want side lying down position whatever they do it is important to understand that the baby's nose should not be smothered and it is the chin which has to be close to the baby's uh, the, the baby's chin has to be close to the mother's breast mm-hmm. and uh, that is the best position and uh, the mother can hold her nipple this way so that uh, the nose is not being the baby is not being smothered with that uh, uh, large breast in some patients and that way the baby when he can inhale also so then he can comfortably suck on for a long time okay so whether it is sitting or lying down doesn't make any sense any difference only the mother has to be mother and baby both have to be comfortable and the baby has to be well supported the baby's back should be well supported may it be on bed or may it be on mother's hand that is what you can see this uh, uh, cross cradle and cradle hold all this they, you have to support the baby's back way and if at all you are feeding from a side lying position then you have to turn the baby completely towards the mother it shouldn't be that the baby is lying in supine position you are trying to just uh, turn the neck of the baby like a turtle so baby will have twist at the neck so baby will not be comfortable so you have to see that the baby is comfortable and not having any problem somewhere so that uh, once again revises practically our breastfeeding techniques so how early that's uh, i think that will be the last question for you how early we should start breastfeeding mangala has covered it very well how as, it should be as initiation soon as, possible, uh, as soon as possible yes, right how, at the uh, labor table we can start off that is not a problem yes correct very well that's what the message we want to give that government of india has recommended is a initiative called as ma mother's absolute affection and they are recommending delivery of the baby on mother's abdomen so that you put the baby on mother's abdomen even before cutting the cord if the baby is active not depressed or distressed then even before cutting the cord let the baby crawl towards mother's breast <clears throat> so that the baby can breastfeed on its own so There's thank you else which i wanted to add on ma'am mm-hmm. uh, regarding the fibroadenosis that's a commonest condition uh, in our opds and i would say that 80% of the times we are not very sure whether it is fibroadenosis or it's something else so you should have very strong index of suspicion and in age of 40 plus you should have very low threshold patients if they have not got their mammography done in all patients with fibroadenosis i have seen so many patients in which fibro considering it as fibroadenosis the things were shrugged off and the mammography was not done that should be done more frequently and in a younger age patients you know less than 40 who have dense breast mm-hmm. the fibroadenosis and that is not yes. well differentiated ultrasound should be done more frequently that is what is the recommendation doctor anubhava we are coming to it after 40 even if the mother has no symptoms we have to go for mammography as a routine so coming to dr manisha uh, we have this uh, woman 25 year old para one who has undergone cesarean section 10 days back and now she has come back to you with fever which is painful breast lump and when you examine you find tachycardia she is febrile her right breast is engorged then standard 
left is also tense tender hot and there is a fluctuating swelling 6 by 6 cm what is your diagnosis and how would you manage this case good evening dr sneha and thank you dr arti and all organizers for having me as a panelist uh ma'am this patient seems to be having mastitis in one of the breast and the other breast has a fully formed breast abscess and she's having difficulty probably because of the cesarean and difficulty in the initial days there was a latching problem and this led to mastitis and then a full formed breast now because of the problem in the other breast also if we don't treat it will also change into a breast abscess so first and foremost with clinical examination it is very clear we need to uh, get her temperatures under control get her a little comfortable her fever needs to be treated with paracetamol if she is not on antibiotics we need to start antibiotics and for the uh, breast which is just having mastitis and engorgement mm -hmm. we would allow her to have a little bit of fermentation so that the breast becomes softer and allow yes. the baby to be healing from we that covered the engorgement now yes. we want to i, I want to ask you abscess, yes in the breast abscess uh, we would want to because it's a big fluctuating abscess we want to drain it and in the opd procedure once the fevers are down with a wide bore needle under local anesthesia we need to get the pus out because with such severe pain and discomfort it is not going to be relieved until and unless the pus is made to drain or it drains on its own so how will you drain is, it that is my under question how will you drain uh, it under local anesthesia in the opd Whether with a wide to bore do incision and drainage or you want to ask no needle with a wide bore needle a 14 or 16 gauge needle yes, we would just try to aspirate as much <clears throat> pus as possible so that the pus is drained and her throbbing pain and the symptoms have become a little lesser and once uh, that becomes okay we would allow her to use a compress and feed the baby from the same breast also okay that is perfect in fact that is what the message we want to give here from this platform pus anywhere in the body has to be drained out so along with supportive management your aim should be first and foremost to drain it out but not incision and drainage that is very very clear because age old days all of us i'm sure are referring the patient to surgeon surgeons are going ahead with incision and drainage and you are your patient is coming back to you for daily dressings and yes. she is landing up into worsening of problems even the other breast she can have breast abscess so it worsens the situation your aim should be continuation of breastfeeding so you don't want anesthesia you don't want surgery you don't want the post operative packing you don't want to discontinue the breastfeeding and that is why we must go for needle aspiration as you have rightly said number 14 or 16 gauge needle if it is a smaller abscess single one or two aspiration for this yes yes for this definitely you would li like to go for repeated aspirations yes. and if if at all it is multi loculated again you have to clear the locula and go for multiple aspiration sometimes with ultrasound guidance you can uh, do the aspiration that will help you uh, cover all the locula yes. and you are not missing the locula yes. correct if it is a superficial abscess like this i don't think you need but yes i have mentioned here you you, you can go for usc guided aspiration if it is a deep seated abscess very true okay so this is the evidence what cochrane database says there are multiple studies almost six studies more than 325 patients they have compared both the modalities of management both are equally effective that is what the conclusion at present because these studies are very very small they they are not able to come to the conclusion which one is superior but for us as obstetrician it serves our purpose to continue the breastfeeding which is so very beneficial not only to the mother to the baby but to the entire nation you all have seen how mangala has expressed so that's how we have to continue breastfeeding and that is how it should help that we have to go for repeated or as per requirement aspiration needle aspiration and never 
incision and drainage. So can a mother with breast, breast abscess breastfeed? This was a question. Yes, very dogmatic answer. So Dr. Arati has covered this aspect of screening for breast cancer or evaluation of breast, uh, breast lump, I would say. So evaluation of breast lump, she has covered. But screening, only few aspects. I will just in short uh, run through. Uh, we have risk screening. So what are the risk factors? Breast screening, that is the local examination and genetic screening. So why there is a need for screening of breast cancer? Because you, have, you all have seen what is the incidence. And for any woman, lifetime risk of one in eight, that high is the incidence of breast cancer. Uh, as you have heard to uh, listen to Dr. Arthi Lutra that the incidence of breast cancer has become so high that it has left CA cervix behind and the mortality is also very high. So we have certain risk factors like modifiable and non-modifiable. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details. You have to just go through, uh, talk to your patient and see that whether she has any of these risk factors. So Dr. Radhika, uh, is uh, Dr. Radhika here? She was supposed to join late. Dr. Radhika? When uh, you... no, yes. Radhika is not here, but Dr. Okay. Yamini or no, myself, no. Dr. Yamini ah, can take the ah. question. So, Dr. Arati, you have already covered when do you start uh, self-examination. But yes, you can say it once again. When should a woman so breast start self-examination self in young women? At it what age? Uh, can we give, uh, yeah, it has to be started early, like around 20 years when they start menstruating mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. have to palpate the breast every month. Post-menstrual is the best time because then they are not tender. Younger right. patients and menopausal patients, they have to have a fixed time like uh, every month, you know, maybe first yeah, week of first every week month or... so, so that they don't miss examining. So how, how do you do this? self-breast examination, what all things you want to see. Yeah, I, I have answered it, but I think Yamini is with us. Yamini, would you like to yeah. add? She's the young uh, we, have, we have some more I questions for uh, Yamini. So okay. I will just... I'll, I'll tell Radhika's part. Yeah, yeah these are all uh, so the, the examination and the no. same examination done by clinician. Yes, without yeah. using any gadgets, that is clinical breast examination. So I quickly yeah. run through skip, uh, some of the slides and we yeah. go ahead with the, uh, we have screening guidelines, which uh, you have covered already. So Dr. Mitra, Dr. Mitra Saxena, is she there around? We have this uh, Dr. Mitra. Okay, so Dr. Ka, uh, Yamini can take up this case. 32 year old Nali Paras woman, she notices a lump in left press uh, two months ago. Uh, it's painless and when you examine you find two by two centimeter vague irregular swelling not tender uh, hard inconsistency uh, there is no axillary lymph node no nipple discharge and the lump is uh, you know uh, quite freely mobile not adherent to the skin or the underlying structure uh, dr yamini uh, what is your probable diagnosis and how do you manage this case uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Like Arti ma'am, uh, Uttarakhand Society Foxy for uh, and uh, Dr. Sneha ma'am yourself for arranging this excellent uh, webinar, which is very comprehensive on a very important talk, topic and for including me on it. So uh, coming to the case, as uh, already discussed, uh, triple assessment is what is uh, recommended for it, along with clinical examination, which we had a thorough examination, which goes in favor of the management mark. We will go for an uh, imaging, which will be sonomammography. So, uh, because it's a young uh, patient, sometimes in case mammography is inconclusive, we can consider breast MRI. And thereafter, if any, uh, if the findings of examination are confirmed and we are suspecting uh, malignancy, we go in for a two-cut biopsy, which is preferable over an SMAC. And if uh, there, uh, okay, Amini, uh, can you please increase your volume? I think it's difficult to. Here, volume of your device. Uh, Ma'am, my volume is. I'll just log in for my phone otherwise. Okay. Is it still okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Better, ma okay, yeah mini, I think. Yeah. Is it better, ma? Right now. Hello. What is your plan of management? 
Ma'am, if a malignant. What is case? What is your diagnosis? Diagnosis most likely is a malignant lesion, breast carcinoma. Mm -hmm. And what stage? Uh, this one will be stage T two N zero N zero. Because stage okay. T is two to five. So what for this mm -hmm. patient? What management you want to plan? For this patient, we can give her. Uh, we would go ahead with surgery. And we can give her two options. What I kind of surgery? We can offer a breast conservative surgery as well, but uh, then she has to know that uh, she will have to undergo radiation. If breast conservative surgery is offered, breast RT is a must. Uh, okay. Nodal RT can be uh, will depend on the nodal status and the nodal area. Yes, but considering her age and the stage of malignancy, you plan a because it's an early breast cancer. You plan for a conservative. Surgical management. How do you counsel this woman for this matter? Uh, counseling for whether it is the surgery and that's all or something else. Uh, surgery. She will also need adjuvant chemotherapy and along with that hormonal receptor status (ERPR). Is it that conservative surgery along with radiotherapy? That is how you have to counsel her. Uh, ma'am, we uh, can uh, counsel her based on. Uh, uh, we can give her both the options because sometimes patients don't want to take any chance, even though breast conservative surgery is shown to have equal survival to modify. Yes, Dr. Arthi, whether you want to say something? No, I'll let her complete first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, ma'am, both the options. She has completed. Okay. He has completed. Whether you differ, whether you differ, uh, I don't want any repetition. Whether you differ, no. Uh, early breast cancer, the conservative surgery is always accompanied by radiotherapy. It's yes. a message you have to consider the woman that it's not, it's not the conservative surgery, the cosmetic surgery, and that's all. You are be relieved. No. It's a surgery along with radiotherapy, and then after the surgery, you send the tissue for histopathology, ERPR, HER2, and then according to these treatment, you have to these uh, reports. You have to you know uh, plan her uh, post of chemotherapy or uh, hormone therapy or Herceptin, whatever is suitable, and she has to be in a long term follow. -up. So even if you know patient, they find it very cozy that yes, early breast cancer and conservative surgery and that's all. So the message should be very, very loud and clear that it is conservative surgery along with, always with radiotherapy. That is what the message and long-term follow-up. Okay. In addition, uh, uh, advice to her, BRCA testing, because she falls in the high-risk category for uh, being positive for hereditary association. Yes, that we'll come to the genetic testing, whether you want to go for genetic testing of every woman or we should restrict it to some women. So, so Dr. Yamini, I think we continue with you. Now, you have this young lady, very small, early breast cancer. You have planned her conservative surgery. Now, she is insisting for oncoplasty. What is oncoplasty? Can you uh, discuss with our uh, attend for our attendees that what is oncoplasty and how do you plan it? Whether you have to do the surgery first and then plan this oncoplasty or how? Um, oncoplasty, currently breast conservative surgery, they are referring it more as oncoplasty because it is not just removal of the mask, you have to give a good contour and maybe you need to take in the plastic surgeon to uh, get back the contour. And uh, it also depends like uh, where the lesion is located, whether breast conservative surgery, there are some criteria like it should be preferably a single lesion and the breast to the tumor ratio is very important. Like a very lean patient with a very uh, small breast, even a smaller lesion, you might not be able to reconstruct her breast very well. So it yes. depends on the breast. To the so tumor. how much should be the free margin? Free margins are as such, the in margin should be free. The margin should be free. That will not be positive. Grossly, we keep around uh, like around one centimeter of gross margin is what is okay. required at the time of surgery. Okay. So you, we continue with you only, but we go to the next case. Uh, you have this young lady. Uh, she's para one, just delivered two months back. And she comes to you with a red swollen uh, edematous right-sided breast. Um, 
painful breast. You know, she's getting severe burning, insect bite, like uh, uh, itching and burning. When you examine, you find the right breast is totally swollen, edematous, tender. Uh, and at places, you have podrange appearance. And uh, there's no nipple retraction, no, uh, no nodes as, uh, as well. Um, you find, uh, you, on further inquiry, you find that she has received a course of antibiotics, but there's no response. What is your differential diagnosis for this case? And uh, how would you go ahead with the management? Now, because she has a course of antibiotics response and she has a very uh, uh, alarming sign to the orange. Yeah, what is your differential diagnosis? I would say. What is your first? One can be first, at first, we will think of mastitis considering the post. Yes, very true. Correct. But second is we should always have high suspicion for inflammatory breast carcinoma because she mm -hmm. has the orange appearance, which is typical in that, and she it has not responded to antibiotics and anti-inflammatory agents, and it is a very Correct. rapidly growing malignancy. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we have ruled it out completely before continuing okay. any consultation. Okay. So uh, how what what will you do for this case? Okay. She comes to you. Yes, ma'am. I would uh, like to uh, offer a solo mammography. Uh, so that mm -hmm. would be the first thing. And uh, if any lesion or lump... It's is done normal, and it's normal. It is normal. There's, yeah, there's no lump, no lymph nodes, nothing. And... Uh, so, how would you confirm the diagnosis? Mammo also? No, Sometimes no. nothing is there, but still, if clinically we are suspecting, we can go for a bad thing in such cases. Because yes, but you have to point. confirm it. So that's what I'm asking you. What will you do to confirm or to rule out? So it's a biopsy. Yes. And that too, especially okay. skin biopsy at the edge of the skin or maybe a true cut biopsy. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yes. biopsy is the only confirmatory investigation here. Even so, no mammo is not confirmatory. It may be normal just, and that's all. Okay, so once you diagnose, uh, why are you worried about this malignancy so much? What is so peculiar about this? It is a very rapidly metastatizing malignancy with a very guarded prognosis. Within a month... Yes, aggressive type of malignancy. Aggressive type of malignancy, that is one. Secondly, the moment it presents, it is already, uh, already stage three and beyond. Because it is presenting at the skin. Okay. So, late presentation, late diagnosis and very aggressive type of, usually it is HER2 positive. That is one more problem. So, naturally, you have to go for uh, the surgical management, chemotherapy and of course, uh, as per the reports, chemo or hormone therapy and of course, uh, the Herceptin. I think uh, this so young lady. Pet CT, pet CT or CT abdomen, pelvis, and yes, pet CT yes. has a big role in such cases because they could have this in medicine. Naturally, this is a rapidly spreading malignancy, so complete workup has to be done, and this definitely requires a very close surveillance. So now, because she is a young lady, and uh, maybe. She wants, uh, naturally, she's on treatment. She wants to use contraception. What contraception you will advise her? Um, as such, uh, progesterone is contraindicated in breast cancer cases. So even though... Which, even which, what? Are you, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, let me, let me hear once again. What did you say? Um, progesterone, uh, giving progesterone can uh, <coughs> lead to higher chances of recurrence. So as such, no, progesterone, no. I would... No, no. I uh, absolutely disagree with you. Even pregnancy doesn't lead to higher risk. What we are talking about is uh, because suppose she is, she is a known case of malignancy and she is receiving tamoxifen. So to counteract this, we have to give progesterone. In fact, progesterone only pills or uh, injectable progesterone or LNG IOS. These are the ideal contraceptives for these women. And after completion, when now next question is naturally, when can she plan for second pregnancy? Uh, it's been partly into status of the disease and uh, how extensive it was, what was the status, like the ERPR positive disease that has a better prognosis. And usually if she has taken like post-treatment amoxicillin for two years and on follow-up there has been uh, no suspicion and eventually she can be advised to 
consider pregnancy? Yes, at least two years after completion of the treatment, she can consider. At least two years after completion of the treatment. Even in okay. ERPR positive, uh, we can give progesterone only pills? Can we give progesterone only pills even to the patient uh, for ERPR positive? Yes. See, see, we are talking about ERPR positive only because she is receiving tamoxifen. And we have on one side you have naturally estrogen and progesterone sensitive tumor where you are giving tamoxifen. And you, because of tamoxifen, you are having endometrial hyperplasia and even you have started already this spectrum. So sometimes to counteract this, you may have to, I mean, rather progesterone is preferred. Basically, for such women, mechanical barrier contraceptives are to be preferred. But as you all will agree to me that pregnancy is absolutely not allowed. So in this situation, maybe progesterone only pills or LNG. Or LNG yes. yes. And that this will take care of the... Uterus. This is something for which patient comes to us only. Yes, you know, that's what I'm saying. That is what I'm yeah. saying. That there, even once you uh, early diagnosis and treatment or referring to surgeon is not the end of this. We have one more panel discussion which says, you know, uh, your role of gynecologist after diagnosis of breast cancer that takes you till the end of the, you know, uh, that woman's lifespan, you have to follow her, guide her for management, guide her for treatment, uh, follow up her for side effects and whatever contraception, future pregnancy, all these things we have to take care. And that's the very reason somebody has written that, you know, breast is our organ. Yes. So I, that's the reason I have written that, yes, by virtue of our practice, breast is definitely obstetricians and gynecologist domain. So I, I hope all of you agree to be. And uh, I think that brings it to the end of this panel discussion. As I have already said, once again, my humble appeal to all the Foxians, rather all the gynecologists and obstetricians of this country, that please make it a point or habit to examine the breast of every woman who comes to you for whatever their problem. At least if you find something abnormal, notify it as Dr. Arthi has said that diagrammatically you mention it. If at all there is any abnormality, you refer her for further investigation. If no abnormality, teach her self-breast examination. Make her breast aware so that at least whatever abnormality she can notice at home, she can bring it to your notice and we can catch the breast malignancy or abnormalities early. And that's the only way we can save their lives. So once again, I thank you all the esteemed panelists for uh, their inputs. Very, very interactive panel. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arti Lutra. And I thank my mentor, Dr. P.K. Shah, for witnessing the panel discussion, guiding us all the time. And thank you so much, uh, sir. And uh, I think uh, I, I can, I invite sir to have some comments. And then- Before that, before that I just want to say one, one small line. Yes, that, uh, as very well said by Dr. Sneha, that breast is the domain of gynecologist. Uh, for any breast cancer or breast cancer, there are only three things which are very, very important for all of us to keep in mind that we uh, there are only three ways: self-examination of breast, then diagnosing on sono or mammography, and then tissue biopsy. These are the three things which are which take us to the diagnosis. So keep those three things in mind and diagnose every patient, every woman early. As we all know that in our country, the breast cancer has, uh, you know, the age of breast cancer is going has gone down very much. So let's all come together and save all women from this deadly disease and yes. get, get them full treatment. Age is no bar. Yeah, yes. age is no bar. And thank you, Dr. Shah, sir, for being here. Uh, we are <laughs> really, uh, you know, are feeling blessed uh, yes, for you to be here, uh, you know, throughout the panel. So we are blessed, sir, for you, thank your you. being here, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Charu, thanks a lot. Sneha, and sir. <laughs> I, heard, I heard all the three lectures also in yeah. addition to Charu, your panel. Yeah. And it's an excellent webinar. And I'm sure 
people have learned something very positive and they will take back this memory at the end of the year and i wish you all all the very best especially charu you and anju you <laughs> charu also for yeah very happy healthy bright and prosperous new year thank you thank, thank you so much sir. sir thank you sir thank you very much sir good night sir good night uh, good night Thank you, Doctor Arati. I think uh, over to you, Charu, for the yes. formal vote so of thanks. Is Doctor Arati here, Doctor Arati? No, Doctor uh, Arati has some work. I think she is not able to come back. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to have been you know um, a part of this organization i am a fledgling here we had dr pikesha sir dr anju soni ma'am sneha bhuya and so many others who are working in such greater and bigger capacities uh, i look forward uh, to holding their hand and uh, working uh, and doing better work uh, in foxy in the future thank you yes. very much uh, jai hind jai maharashtra thank you so much thank you <clears throat> and our family member <clears throat> dr sarveshwari of course dr sarveshwari who, who belongs to dehradun so we feel like coming home thank you so much sarveshwari madam most, thank you most, uh, oh, thank you sir thank you sir joining uh, uttarakhand so very active press committee members uh, <laughs> <laughs> so arti and uh, minu i'm going to join you all very soon <laughs> thank you so much one Goodbye. thing i just want to tell you Thanks. that i'm doing evenis camp in all the villages of the foothills of masuri so i have Good. covered i think 15 villages oh my god that is immense work <laughs> great great you will compile and everything and send it yes, to me please i have covered 15 i'll give all the report to arti to you also okay and to thank sneha you. okay thank you thank you so thank much thank you goodbye and good night stay safe stay healthy and a happy new year to each and every one of you and we hope that it is a better happier and healthier one thank you thank you thank you, you. Thank thank you so much thank thank you. nice to see thank anupama you. and yamini dr anupama nice to see you both thank you bye dr anupama. yamini very interesting I and along with jay marasha it is jay uttarakhand too Oh, Jadra, the you know Dev yes. Bhumi, the land of the gods, and Santa Claus was the king. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Yes. Jai, Jai Hind. Who's the first? Not Jai Maharashtra. <laughs> Jai Hind. Jai Without Bhakti. Jai Hind, there is nothing. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone. It was a very good evening.